Yeah, another session, yeah. <laughs> Very good, so let's start today. Welcome back to the Mimi Colloquium. And uh, the first speaker uh, is uh, Gertrude Zwignagel from Brunswick University. And uh, the title is Field Induced Leafage Transitions and as a probe for Fermi, heavy fermion band structure. So, hello, uh, everybody. First, I would like to thank the organizers to make it possible that we can meet in this uh, digital forum and to keep the community together by this way. So my title, the title of my talk is Field Induced Lifshitz Transitions. And I would like to show you that we can use these Lifshitz transitions to probe the heavy fermion band structure. Uh, this is joint work with the co-authors I list below. You will hear talks by Alexandre and also uh, then later uh, by uh, Andrei Valamov uh, on, on this topic. Now, uh, oh yeah, now it works. So the brief outline is I will start with a short introduction. Then I will show you how one can calculate, uh, uh, quantitatively calculate Lipschitz transitions in uh, strongly renormalized quasi-particle bands uh, by means of the renormalized band method. I will apply this to ytterbium rhodium to silicon two, where we know that the heavy quasi-particles result from a local condo effect. That means by a local singlet formation. And then I will apply everything to uh, uranium, palladium to aluminum three, where the heavy quasi particles result from a completely different mechanism. Namely, uh, they are due to the intra-atomic uh, correlations, which are typically formulated in terms of Hund's rules. And then uh, I will close with a summary and an outlook. Now, uh, Lifshitz transitions in heavy fermion materials have been observed already a very long time ago. Here I show the phase diagram of cerium copper to silicon two, uh, uh, where we plot the different phases as a function of temperature and magnetic field. Cooling down from high temperatures, one first hits a phase which is called phase A, uh, and this phase was identified uh, to be a spin density wave phase. The uh, wave vector, the propagation vector, can be related to nesting on the Fermi surface. This A phase encloses the superconducting phase, which sparked the whole correlation physics uh, in, in the 70s. Now, if the magnetic field is applied, then there is a first order phase transition from the spin density wave phase to a phase B. Uh, there are signatures that phase B is also a spin density wave phase, but with a completely different wave vector. And what occurs there, this transition seems to be triggered by a Fermi surface reconstruction. And that's uh, what is shown here. Uh, the Fermi surface of the heavy quasi particle somehow uh, disrupts here at certain places, and then the wave vector changes. Uh, this has not been shown so far by neutron scattering, but there's neutron evidence in the related compound cerium copper to germanium to where one can see that at this wave vector, uh, at this magnetic field, somehow the propagation vector of the spin density wave changes. So we see here the Fermi surface changes as a function of the of a relatively moderate uh, magnetic field, and this has consequences on the observation of properties in, in, in these heavy fermion materials. Now. Uh, 
we all know the whole session here is devoted to Lifshitz transitions. And these topological transitions uh, really can affect the properties dramatically in heavy fermion materials. We have the subtle interplay between complex orders and the Fermi surface topology in quantum matter in general. The, these uh, topological transitions, they are typically associated with critical points in the band structure. That means there are certain points in K-space where the gradient of the of the this band energy vanishes. And uh, of course, there are dramatic effect, effects when this occurs close to the Fermi surface. Now, uh, these critical points always have to be present in a band structure simply because of the periodicity of the band dispersion in K space. So they are a consequence of the periodicity. But in normal metal, they occur somewhere uh, far away, typically from the Fermi surface, because the bandwidth is so broad. In heavy fermion materials, on the other hand, the bandwidth is very small, so it is possible to shift the, these critical points to the Fermi surface, to the Fermi energy, to the chemical potential, for example, by a magnetic field or a moderate doping. And this has consequences for the interpretation, for example, of uh, quantum oscillation data and for many other properties. In, we will use this to analyze the band structure in the vicinity of the critical points. In the vicinity of the critical points where the gradient of the dispersion vanishes, we can expand the, uh, the dispersion uh, in terms of uh, deviations of the, from the critical wave vector. And here in our, in our cases, we uh, can, we, we can uh, be, this it's, a, it's sufficient to go to second order. That means in the cases I will discuss, we do not have this uh, highly interesting uh, multi-critical points and uh, higher order critical points. So here this dispersion then can be, sim uh, can be approximated by a number which gives the position of the critical point relative to the chemical potential and some expansion parameters which is proportional to the inverse effective mass. Now the critical points are known to show up in the van Hove singularities in the density of states, but there will, uh, you will see that there are dramatic effects in transport when these critical points approach the Fermi energy. And uh, Alexandre Pouret and also uh, Andrei Balamov will tell you, uh, will give you very interesting examples for that. Now, uh, tuning the critical points means uh, we shift this energy to the to the chemical potential and uh, then this means that we can analyze the quasi particle states uh, uh, by varying the magnetic field now uh, the main point however is that this connection between the distance to the to the chemical potential and also the effective masses are uh, dependent on the magnetic field. And uh, this, uh, this uh, dependence on the magnetic field is highly, maybe highly tr uh, non-trivial in strongly correlated systems and that's what we will discuss here. A new aspect is that uh, the line shape which one gets from the contributions around these critical regions uh, that uh, can be used to analyze mechanisms and uh, also to analyze the band structure in, in this regime. Now, uh, 
in heavy fermion materials, we know that the quasi-particle masses are very high and the bandwidths are small. So this means that we can induce Lifshitz transitions by relatively moderate magnetic fields, but uh, it's uh, the main complication is that the bandwidth, the narrow bandwidth is a consequence of many body effects. So if we want to describe this theoretically, we need a method which accounts for the local complex local many body physics and allows to include the coherence in the periodic lattice. And uh, that's what will be done by the renormalized band method. To remind you, uh, if we have strongly correlated systems, we have to go beyond the independent particle picture. And to see what we are talking about, I plot here the cartoon, of the spectral function, which gives the probability of adding or, rem or removing an electron to the system. Here you see it on this uh, picture from physics today. If the, the, if we have a normal metal, well, we can neglect the local Coulomb repulsion, then typically we have a density of states, which is partially filled, and there's a finer density of states at uh, the Fermi energy, and that's it. As the particle starts to interact uh, by this strong Coulomb repulsion, then uh, these wings, there will wings, they will appear, and then of course, these may separate uh, and uh, a very narrow quasi-particle peak, which has coherent band-like excitations may appear around the Fermi energy. But if we further increase the, the repulsion, then these two side wings may separate and we have a metal to insulator transition. In an F-electron system, in, in, we have these two situations. There is, uh, we have this case where we have a localized F orbital which does not form coherent state. And the most interesting situation is uh, this one. That's where the heavy fermions appear as uh, a resonance, as a many body resonance, uh, which appears at low, energies and which is strongly renormalized. The question is now if we want to calculate the consequences uh, for the to look for the critical points in, in the dispersion and so on, the question is can we model the dispersion of these coherent uh, low energy excitations by band theory because we need the to account for the periodicity of the lattice to find these uh, periodic at uh, these critical points. Now, uh, typically, if we talk about block states, we can adopt a scattering picture. And here, the block states arise from a multiple scattering of the electrons of uh, effective necessary local potentials, which are here sitting at the atomic sites. The material-specific information uh, is contained in the single site T matrix. The arrangement of the scattering center stats uh, structural properties. Now, uh, in a heavy fermion material, we will adopt this scheme. We will use the T matrix, which contains the material-specific information from standard band structure calculations as it is obtained within density functional theory for the non-correlated, for the not so strongly correlated electrons for the conduction electrons. The F channels, however, for the F channels, we will use the many body single site T matrix and this will depend on the mechanism we have, which is operative to uh, form the the, the, the quasi-particles. This many-body single side T matrix will be parameterized in the spirit of Landau. Uh, so we introduce a small set of parameters in the spirit of Landau to calculate the quasi-particles. But of course, the choice of the parameters, that uh, will depend on the microscopic model. 
for a condo lattice, we know that we have a resonant scattering at a low energies and we parameterize this by a resonant phase shift characterized by a, a renormalized bandwidth of the order of a milli electron volt and the position relative to the Fermi energy. If we impose the condition that there should be no redistribution of charges because charges uh, a changes in the charge distribution corresponds to high energies of the order of the Coulomb energy, then we can eliminate one of the parameters and we are left with a single parameter theory, uh, which can be fitted to the specific heat. In the presence of a magnetic field, of course, these parameters will become uh, field dependent and uh, the field dependence cannot be estimated from effective theories. We need a microscopic theory to calculate this field dependence of these uh, parameters, the position, which means, uh, for example, in a, the, the splitting of this resonance in a magnetic field, the effective Zeeman splitting, and of course, uh, the width of the resonance. Now, uh, uh, a brief comment on how this compares, for example, to the density, uh, to, to the dynamical mean field theory. Both schemes have in common that they use conduction electrons from first principles, and both schemes introduce parameters for the correlated electrons. In the renormalized band theory, we parameterize directly this low energy peak, and uh, we introduce a single parameter deduced from the average specific heat. Uh, in the dynamical mean field theory, in, in this picture, one would use introduce parameters for these Hubbard sidebands and then use theory to calculate the evolution and to, to uh, get this peak. What the difference is, is that we do not have charge redistribution here uh, in our scheme, but that in the condo regime where the F account uh, practically doesn't change, uh, it seems to be, it, it's okay. It would be a different story if we were to consider uh, mixed valent materials. Now, uh, I mentioned that we have to calculate uh, the magnetic field dependence. Uh, and for this, we really need a, a microscopic theory. Uh, in principle, we have to calculate the full many body, the, the condo problem in a magnetic field. Now, uh, there is a very efficient ansatz, a, a theory developed by Houston and his group, and uh, to extract the quasi-particle parameters by means of a renormalized perturbation theory. The first calculations I did was uh, I extracted the parameters from an, a numerical renormalization group, which is a very costly uh, the, the, the approach. But with this theory, we can really do it for a wide range of magnetic fields. The main idea here is to proceed in close analogy to quantum electrodynamics and to use perturbation the perturbation expansion, but uh, not to expand it in bare parameters, which would end up in having a lot of divergent terms, but rather to expand in terms of renormalized quantities. Of course, the renormalized quantities uh, correct uh, contain already uh, interaction effects. So we have to correct for the overcounting by introducing counter terms. Then with this, we can construct a renormalization flow uh, starting from the weakly correlated regime in high magnetic fields in, and we will assume ridiculously high magnetic fields uh, and we construct a renormalization flow down to the strongly correlated low field regime. The flow equations, uh, they are dr uh, drastically simplified by conservation laws and symmetry considerations, like, for example, the Friedel sum rule, ward ident uh, identities, the thermodynamic sum rule, and so on. And uh, if we apply this, if you do this with very simple diagrams, with the simple diagrams, 
shown here, which contains only the lowest order for the for the vertex corrections, then we get excellent uh, results. For example, for the uh, renormalization of the width, which is the width of our resonance. Here I plot the in red the results of this uh, renormalized perturbation theory and the data lie really on top of the results of the numerical renormalization group which is shown as open black circles. So with this very simple scheme we can cover the uh, whole range of magnetic fields and calculate then the magnetic field dependent band structure. Now, uh, the, the first application was uh, ytterbium rhodium to silicon 2. This material uh, crystallizes in the tetragonatorium chromium to silicon 2 structure. Uh, in a vanishing magnetic field, we have two major uh, sheets, and this Fermi surface was confirmed by ARPES here in, uh, along this axis. This material has been known for uh, for uh, exhibiting an unusual quantum critical point where the, we have a transition from an antiferromagnetic phase to a, 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 a Fermi liquid. So uh, the regime we are considering here is uh, in this Fermi liquid regime where we can safely apply uh, all this Fermi liquid uh, wording and, and the Fermi liquid ideas. It was found that uh, there are, are structures at the characteristic fields in, the trans in practically all uh, transport properties. And here I show experiments which were really done independently and they showed structures at the same magnetic fields and uh, they in these early calculations could be uh, 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 to a, a series of four transitions which are also present uh, which are uh, indic uh, where we can have where we have um, structures in the density of states but of course there are there is more uh, more structure also here around 11 tesla and uh, this was a measurement of uh, Alexandre Pouré. He showed that there is a whole cascade of transition in, uh, in, in a relatively small uh, magnetic field range, which means that the transition, that the disappearance of parts of, the, uh, of this Fermi surface happens in several steps. And I, I think uh, Andrei Valamov will tell us more about the signatures uh, and the theory here behind. So there is a cascade uh, of Lifshitz transition in a relatively small interval and uh, they arise from, from this field-induced Lifshitz transition. There are three transitions and uh, when this are, these transitions are accounted for, uh, one can see that the variation of uh, the Zebeck coefficient can be described very well. So this is just quoting the result. Uh, this, it will be discussed in greater detail by Andrei Vanamov. Uh, now I, I will switch to a uranium compound where the F electrons, of, where the five F electrons also form heavy fermions, but through a completely different uh, mechanism. This material has a hexagonal structure, the praseodymium nickel to aluminum three, and uh, one observes the co somehow the coexistence of localized five F electrons and. Uh, and of course five F bands. The moments uh, that the localized character is, can be seen from the magnetic moments, for example, and uh, the, the presence of 
uh, itinerant 5F electrons can be seen from the gamma coefficient and of course from the superconducting transition temperature uh, uh, where we have a discontinuity uh, uh, in, in, uh, co which is consistent with a BCS uh, uh, discontinuity. Now the model assumption we have here for the microscopic model is that the heavy quasi-particles result from an orbital selective uh, transition. That means that some of the hopping matrix elements are renormalized to almost to zero as a consequence of intra-atomic Hunsrud type correlations. And uh, this assumption is supported by the 5F spectra, uh, which exhibit both itinerant and uh, localized signatures. Just to explain what I mean, how this heavy, this renormalization occurs, there's this old uh, riddle about the man who has to transport a, a cabbage, a goat, and a wolf across a river. And in this case, it's very important. These here are highly correlated. That means you cannot just take out one and transfer it over. You have to always to have to be careful what you leave behind. And this, that you have to be careful what you leave behind, that means uh, you, if you have a, 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 some configuration at the F side, you cannot just transfer at a single F electron to the other one. With, you have to make sure that you do not mess up your system. You do not create high uh, excitations. Now, with this assumption, we calculated that we could reproduce the mainly the Fermi surface and the effective masses uh, with in. Uh, without assuming any parameters. Now, uh, in transport, uh, one observes uh, now uh, here in, in, in the transport measurements of Alexandre, who will speak next about uranium, one observes uh, structures which seem to be related to successive Lifshitz transitions. Uh, the, the Fermi surface, as showed before, has uh, here a very heavy band. That's the most heavy band. And this can break up in a magnetic field here. It's the majority. It, it, this here is a hole-like band, and uh, it can uh, break up and lead to structures. And also, there are some minor Fermi surface pockets, which can uh, disappear also in, by applying a magnetic field. With this, we get several transitions. Now we have to convert, of course, uh, the, uh, the energies which we have here from the uh, ISO energy surfaces into magnetic fields. To do this, we assume uh, uh, that we have a constant G factor in this case, and we use the G factor from experiment. And if we do this, then we can see we get uh, these kind of Lipschitz transitions at the magnetic fields marked here as gray lines. And uh, this is remarkably close to the magnetic fields, to the critical magnetic fields and to the structures uh, observed experimentally. Now, uh, these successive uh, anomalies here occur in the antiferromagnetic regime, and here I plotted them again. Uh, so uh, we think uh, that uh, this also shows, it gives a test of uh, not only of the Fermi surface, but also on the band structure away from the Fermi surface. Now, uh, let me summarize uh, the magnetic fields, uh, even relatively moderate magnetic fields can induce uh, topology changes uh, in heavy fermion materials. And uh, 
this is a difficulty which we have to keep in mind when we interpret, for example, uh, data from quantum oscillations. The vicinity of critical points and Lifshitz transitions means that we can have breakdown orbits and all kinds of uh, tunneling experiments and uh, tunneling effects. So it, the, our usual interpretation scheme based on quasi-classical uh, formulae may not always be correct uh, in the vicinity of a Lipschitz point. This most imp an important point is that we showed that transport measurements in a magnetic field, they may provide detailed information about the critical regions in the quasi-particle band structure. So we can test not only the Fermi surface, which is done typically by the uh, by quantum oscillations, but we can also see what the effective masses are in the vicinity of these critical points. But for this, of course, we need a method which uh, can produce the, 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 the uh, block states and also we need a microscopic model which shows how the parameters, the quasi-particle parameters evolve in, uh, in a magnetic field. Uh, we used here the renormalized band method and that's described for example in, in a review which I published in the report of progress in physics. Uh, uh, an, uh, a detailed application was uh, to ytterbium rhodium to silicon 2, which is a condo lattice. Here uh, we have a, a, a microscopic picture, namely that the quasi particles result from the condo effect, and uh, the quasi particles in the magnetic field are calculated by using the the renormalized perturbation theory as an impurity solver in a magnetic field. And it's a highly efficient method which allows us to calculate it for, for many fields. So it, it's not this costly thing as, uh, as a numerical renormalization group. In uranium compounds, especially in uranium palladium to aluminum three, we know from photo emission spectroscopy that we have both, that the F electrons have both itinerant and, uh, and, and uh, localized character. And this means, uh, and using this assumption, uh, we can explain, uh, at least uh, we, we can explain uh, the recon uh, reconstruction of the Fermi surface, which is consistent with the Seebeck coefficient. And with this, I would like to close. I would like to acknowledge the financial support we had. It's coming from the, this French-German uh, collaboration, Ferminest, which is funded by ANR and DFG. Then I'm very grateful for to University to University Grenoble Alp for being uh, given the opportunity to, vi to, to visit there. <coughs> we have another French-German collaboration and of course the European Commission was also very supportive. And with this, uh, I thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your question. Thank you very much for a very nice talk, uh, Gertrude. Uh, I would like to uh, ask for uh, questions. Uh, uh, <coughs> either uh, you can write the question in, in the chat or uh, uh, you can uh, just go ahead. Yeah, so I, I've got to, I've got one uh, to clarify how you take into account uh, a, a, in a, a bit more detail the magnetic field. So basically, you you uh, mention in the case of YRS it is Zeeman splitting, correct? Like yeah. Z uh, yeah. It, yeah. 
So we have the, this, uh, we parameterize this uh, single side T matrix uh, by, uh, for the F channels by a phase shift. And here the phase shift will depend on the magnetic field. There will be a Zeeman splitting and in a magnetic field in a condo system, both the width and the Zeeman splitting will depend in a non-trivial way on the magnetic field. Okay, and that's the way uh, the, the magnetic field is uh, included. Uh, so uh, for example, here, no, this here. Uh, this here is the renormalization, which is fine. I mean, we start from the unrenormalized uh, full width, and then we get the many particle renormalization at uh, low fields. That's fine. It, it, it's continuous. What is surprising is the behavior of the effective G factor. That means the effective Zeeman splitting. This crosses over from uh, here from this uh, Wilson ratio of two, that's the Sommerfeld-Wilson ratio, to one in, uh, in the unrenormalized, or say in, 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 the, in, in the free case. But it doesn't do it in, uh, in any monotonous way, but it goes through a maximum. Sure. And uh, that's, uh, that's the thing which has to be accounted for. We are here in this regime, so we see the rise. Uh, and uh, to get a, a quantitative agreement, this really has to be uh, accounted for. And, and what about the other compound now? Is it the same because it's not condo as far as... It, I... It's not condo. Uh, if you look, uh, so the idea is here, that uh, here they compare different, here this is uranium aluminum three, that's uh, spectra. Uh, they compare uh, the, the spectrum with the band structure calculations. And you see that's more or less okay. But uh, here that's one where you have, where you know that you have bound electrons. That's one where you have a lot of localized electrons and uh, uranium palladium Uh, you, for some reason you are muted. Uh, I don't know. I didn't do anything. It just I just moved my cursor. Okay. So uh, here, for example, you can see here you have uranium aluminum three. Oh, and uh, that's a very that, that's an itinerant compound. You see that that's also the the spectrum, the photoemission spectrum as well. Uh, reproduced by uh, the density functional calculation by something where you have itinerant F electrons. Then here you have uranium gallium 2 and that's a localized one where you have uh, some localized peak and uh, that's an F2 peak. And here you have uranium palladium 2 aluminum 3. You see that uh, a density functional calculation would not be able to get this spectrum. You yeah. have considerable weight here of of localized F electrons. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, we have three F electrons, two of them are localized and one is itinerant. That's basically the story. And the mechanism leading to the separation, that are the Hund's rules. I see. Yeah. Thank <laughs> they you very much. Which channel can hop, so to speak, without uh, having all these high energy excitations? Thank you very much. Any other uh, question? If not, let's thank Gertrude no. once more. Thank you again. It's our pleasure. And the um, next speaker is William Nafo from Toulouse, who is going to tell us about. Oh, the William. Okay, let's go. Uh, the two superconducting phases induced by a magnetic field in uranium tellurium 2, a new superconductor. Oops. Okay, so uh, you can hear me? Is it fine? Yes, perfect. 
And you see my slides, so everything is fine? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so I thank uh, first uh, Joseph for the invitation. And uh, it's a very good experience for me to make a talk like that. And um, so I'm coming from Toulouse, from the Pulse Field uh, Laboratory. And, uh, and uh, just one second, sorry. Yeah. So here is a, is a photo of uh, the surrounding of the lab. So it's a beautiful area in the south of France. And I will present you, in fact, some studies of uranium deteriorate. So it's a new superconductor. It's uh, a superconductor and used by magnetic field also. And uh, so the bad point is that I'm not an expert of Fermi surfaces. So here the talk will mainly deal with uh, magnetic and superconducting properties of this system. I will make the, some uh, link with the Fermi surfaces, uh, the question that we have about Fermi surfaces. And uh, fortunately, Alexandre Pouré will present a talk on the same compound a bit later in the session. And he will present about the Fermi surfaces and uh, measurements and everything. So it will be some kind of introduction of system for which uh, we have very nice effect on uh, superconductivity magnetism for which Fermi surfaces will be uh, important to be understood. And I will try to make some introduction like that. So this is a work done in collaboration with colleagues from uh, Toulouse, of course, from the CA Grenoble, uh, like uh, Alexandre and Georg, uh, who are participating to this session, Daiyoki in Japan, and also the Ashikin Gabriel Sefart in the LNCMI in Grenoble. So the LNCMI is a, a pulse field facility, so it's a high field facility. And it belongs to the EMFL. EMFL is the European Magnetic Field Laboratory on four sites. So Toulouse and Grenoble in France, and uh, Dresden and Nijmegen in Germany and Netherlands. And you have two pulse field sites in Dresden and Toulouse, and two steady field sites in Grenoble and Nijmegen. So the EMFL, it's a way to organize the community in Europe. Uh, we have, uh, for the proposal, when you want to submit experiments, you have to submit them to EMFL for all the four facilities, for instance, and then they organize workshops and conferences. So in Toulouse, we have this kind of uh, pulse fields. So here it's a pulse field profile, magnetic field versus time. And in Toulouse, an advantage, so a particularity of Toulouse sites that were very long pulse compared to other sites in the world. And uh, these are typical magnets that were developed so in 90, from 95 to uh, recently. And we have a panel of experiment of uh, environment offering from 60 Tesla to almost 100 Tesla now. And typically what we have is a generator. So this is the 14 gen megajoule generator of the lab. So in fact, it's a former version. Now it's being reconstructed just currently. And uh, we charge the condensators, the capacitors here, and then we discharge them suddenly in the magnet. So here it's uh, some photo. I'll show you some photo of two magnets, 90 Tesla and 100 Tesla prototype. So here, just to show you the experimental life, so it's an experimental box. The magnet is here in the bottom, here. Here is a view of the magnet inside is nitrogen cluster. So what you need to know is that a pulse field magnet is a resistive magnet. So you send a very intense current into the magnet, so something like 10,000 amperes, corresponding to a charge of 20,000 volts, for a very short time, and after, after the short, the temperature of the magnet increase and the nitrogen bus is here to cool down the magnet. So we need to wait that magnet is cold again to make another shot. So typically one or two hours, depending on the magnet. And here you can see the cross start and the pro. So we have different set of experiments. We can combine pulse field in Toulouse, uh, so pulse field up to 60 Tesla. We can combine them either with a very low temperature using a dilution fridge here. You can see it's a non-metallic uh, insert and we can reach 100 millikelvin, or we can also combine with a pressure cell, we can reach 4 gigapascal. And here, this photo, the last photo here, corresponds to a small probe, 4 millimeter probe, that we use to make experiments in fields higher than 90 Tesla, where the space is limited. We can also have some, uh, we have some neutron setup developed in collaboration with the ALL and the CA. And you can see this setup can be installed on the triple axis spectrometer at ALL and we can offer 40 Tesla. So here we mainly present you data obtained with this dilution fridge. So as introduction, uh, just to emphasize that uh, when we consider quantum magnets, thematics, metals, 
and superconductors in fact there is an overlap between these three uh, groups and the overlap corresponds uh, to a strongly correlated electron system in particular you found your own base superconductors also cuprate and uh, the interesting physics i think occurs exactly at this uh, overlap here so where we have internal magnetism so this uh, can be seen also from uh, when we plot simply the phase diagram, temperature, doping, or pressure. We can see that superconductivity appears exactly when we have uh, a quantum phase transition, quantum magnetic phase transition at uh, magnetic instability. And in the cuprate, there is also this magnetic phase not so far from superconductivity, so it's a quite general question. And schemat schematically, we can see the relationship between these three things. So in many systems, we suspect that superconductivity is uh, mediated by magnetic fluctuations. The link between magnetism and Fermi surface is that we have itinerant electrons which are uh, contributing to magnetism. We have Erkakawa magnetic interactions, we have nesting effects in some systems. And of course, there is a link between Fermi surface and superconductivity because uh, conduction electron becomes superconducting. So when we apply field, we will treat magnetism, the magnetic order of phase. We get a in high field, the polarized paramagnetic state, so where all the magnetic moments are polarized with field, and we can also kill superconductivity, and we can also induce some superconducting phase. So this is the, the part, uh, the, the topic of the talk. So the very famous compound where this has been proved is uranium rhodium germanium, so already 15 years ago. And you can see this superconductor when you apply a field along the B axis, it's a hard magnetic axis, you kill superconductivity at two Tesla. But then you have a run chance of superconductivity, a field and use phase at around 12 Tesla. And this phase is in relation with the high temperature phase transition. It's a metamagnetic transition here. You can see at 12 Tesla. And the fall of this transition is probably accompanied, is accompanied with uh, magnetic fluctuations, which probably leads to superconductivity. And if you look to this uranium, rhodium, germanium, uh, to the data, if you plot the magnetization, you can see that for the field applied along B, so the hard magnetic axis for which we have superconductivity, the metallic transition is very clear. There is a very nice anomaly in the magnetization, a very sudden jump. So this transition leads to superconductivity. And um, if we look to the A coefficient from the electrical resistivity, so this probes the effective mass and uh, this is related with the magnetic fluctuations, we see a large enhancement at HN, at the metallic transition. So this indicates that we have critical magnetic fluctuations induced at this transition, and they probably lead to superconductivity. So there is this review from Daioki, Ishida, and Jacques Pouquet, uh, considering uh, the three ferromagnetic compounds, uranium germanium-2, uranium rhodium germanium, and uranium cobalt germanium. And these three systems are ferromagnetic compounds where, occurs, uh, where superconductivity occurs. Under pressure for uranium or germanium-2, at ambient pressure for the two other. And here you can see pressure phase diagrams. So if you look at the effect of magnetic field on these three systems, so we have a, a field induced phase for uranium, rhodium, germanium, I showed you, but there is also some reinforcement of superconductivity in uranium, cobalt, germanium for the field along B also. And in uranium, germanium too, there is also reinforcement under pressure. So this seems to be something very general. So now I move to the topic, so uranium detelluride. So it's a new superconductor which was discovered um, less than two years ago by the American group of Butch. So it's a paper by Iran, put on archive in end 2018. And this is uranium compound. And uh, you, can, you can see here three signatures, the resistivity, a susceptibility, and heat capacity. Signature of the superconducting phase and it's rather high um, <laughs> Uh, critical temperature from in the best sample it reached almost two Kelvin, and you can see. Uh, so, but uh, the this compound is not ferromagnetic; it's a paramagnetic uh, ground state. Nevertheless, so first, so this study by Ran was confirmed almost immediately by Daioki and uh, his colleagues in, in Grenoble, and uh, even the paper from Daioki was finally published before the paper by Ran. So the initial breakthrough paper, which was published a bit later in August uh, 2019. And if you see the title, the title of the paper by Ran changed, and in the final version, the title is nearly ferromagnetic spin triplet superconductivity. So the idea of Ran and his co-authors is that this system is paramagnetic, but it's very close 
to a ferromagnetic instability, and they suspect that we have uh, ferromagnetic fluctuations leading to spin triplet superconductivity in the system in a very similar way to what has been observed or, or thought to be uh, uh, occurring in the uh, uranium based superconductors that I've mentioned before. So, something very interesting in this paper by Ron is the plot of HC2. And in particular, for the B axis, there is this uh, very anomalous way, so it's a behavior. So, you see an enhancement of superconductivity when you increase the field. So, this Say, show us that uh, from the beginning we have a candidate for field induced superconductivity, and this was confirmed a bit after. I will show you. So, the first experiment we did in Toulouse was this uh, resistivity experiment. So, it was in beginning 2019, and where we showed that for the field along B, there is a metamagnetic transition. You see a very sharp increase of uh, resistivity at HM at 35 Tesla. So, this was confirmed almost immediately by uh, Atsushi Miyake in Japan by magnetization measurement. So he made the measurement maybe one week after uh, this resistivity experiment. And you see a very sharp step in the magnetization. And we saw uh, maybe a very few days after that the American group, again, the paper by RAN, published in Nature Physics, they uh, confirmed our measurement. So they also have this uh, metamagnetic transition, resistivity, magnetization, and also in TDU measurement. You see an anomaly here. So we increase the temperature. And we see that uh, the resistivity, the step that we have, the very sharp first order step, we see that we lose the first order character of the transition at around 7 Kelvin. So if you see here in the phasogram, temperature field phasogram, the first order transition ends in the critical endpoint at around 7 Kelvin. Above this critical endpoint, there is no more transition. But we have a crossover, a very broad crossover in resistivity. It leads to a maximum of resistivity. So we continue to label that HM, and we see that this ends at around 30 Kelvin. So something interesting is that this ends roughly at a temperature corresponding to a TK max, which is a maximum in the magnetic susceptibility measured again along B. So this line here delimits a crossover. It's a crossover which delimits a correlated paramagnetic regime. So it's paramagnetic regime with strong correlation. So roughly it's a heavy fermion uh, regime. And if we look to other heavy fermion paramagnets, so here I consider only paramagnetic compounds, we can see that uh, in most of them, there is also a broad maximum of the magnetic susceptibility, which is related with the ferromagnetic fluctuation. So, and when we plot HM versus TK max, both are almost linearly connected. You can see it's a log log scale. And over more than two decades, there is a very simple relation, one Kelvin to one Tesla. And if we consider uranium detail right, it's a paramagnet, and it fits perfectly with all the other systems. So when we consider this point, uranium deuteride follows a very standard heavy fermion paramagnetic law. That is uh, very clear. There is a difference with the other system, is that in the other system, generally, the field is applied along the easy magnetic axis. Here, if you see, this is a hard magnetic axis. In fact, the easy axis is A, and for the field along A, there is no metamagnetic transition. So this is a, a significant difference, nevertheless. So if we look now the A coefficient from the electrical resistivity, we can see a large enhancement of the A coefficient at HM. So this indicates that we have an enhancement of uh, the effective mass, and thus that we have an enhancement of the magnetic fluctuations. So again, this measurement uh, that we published in the uh, beginning of 2019 was immediately confirmed by heat capacity measurement in pulse field made in Japan, and also by playing with the magnetization data, uh, Miyake succeeded to have also an enhancement of uh, the effective mass. So everything indicates that we have an enhancement of the critical magnet. We have some critical magnetic fluctuation at HM. So the next step, what we did uh, just after this experiment, was to put our sample in a dilution fridge. So we put it two samples in Toulouse, and we uh, found that we have a field-induced uh, superconducting uh, phase, so it's run transfer superconductivity. If you look here in orange, it's a measurement at 250 millikelvin. You can see it's superconducting up to 15 tesla roughly. Then it becomes normal, and then superconducting again. So here we have the first signature of field induced superconductivity in this compound. We had that for our second compound. And in fact, this study was done in strong collaboration with our colleagues from Grenoble. 
And this was uh, two experiment planned in parallel in uh, Toulouse for the pulse field and in Grenoble for the steady field. So here I'll show you the experiment done in Grenoble. So the measurement were obtained just the day after than the measurement in Toulouse. And uh, they were published together, of course. And you can see a very nice, the beautiful data and very clear proof that we have field induced superconductivity when we compare different temperature. So here is the phase diagram, so plot of critical field versus temperature obtained in Grenoble at different angles. So you can see that here at 30 Tesla, there is this field induced uh, reinforcement of superconductivity. And when you rotate the field, you tilt away the field from B to either to the A axis or to the C axis, you see that we lose this field induced uh, run chance, this run chance of superconductivity. And then at uh, angles of typically 10 degree, we have a normal, rather normal shape of HC2 ending around uh, 17, 15, 17 Tesla. So on the right here, you can see a plot of HC2 versus angle, either in the BA plane or in the BC plane. And you can see that the reinforcement of superconductivity between 70 and 35 Tesla is only limited to the small angle here and here. And at high angle, we have no more reinforcement. So in parallel to our study, so the competition was very hard with our uh, colleagues from uh, the US. They also had similar data. So here I show you data they published in, uh, so the, in the paper of RAN, in Nature of Physics. And uh, they also, so these are data obtained in Tallahassee, in steady field. So the equivalent from Kronov, but in the US. And they also find that it's superconducting normal and then superconducting again. So they also find the run chance of superconductivity in this system. So they, what they did that we have not done in Toulouse is that they, comp they also perform pulse field experiments and they combine pulse field with a rotation probe. So it means that they were able to rotate the field in the BC plane and in the BA plane with pulse field. So with fields up to 60 Tesla, as you can see here. So first result is that they confirm this uh, field and use phase for the field along B here. This is this phase, and they confirm that this field and use phase is restricted to small angles around, away from B. But the very surprising, very striking result from their study was the finding of a second field and use superconducting phase, this one here. And this corresponds to a pocket obtained for a field tilted by roughly 30 degrees away from uh, B in the C direction, towards C direction. And what is even more striking is that here, the superconducting phase appears only in the field polarized regime, so in fields higher than HM. And this is very striking because if you consider the first superconducting phase and use biomagnetic field here, yeah, it's only induced below HM. So it's a very different feature for the two. So here on the left, you can see the data they obtained at an angle of around 24 degrees with this superconducting phase developing above 40 Tesla. And you can see from the high temperature part, the metallic transition here is at 40 Tesla. So it's exactly in the field higher than HM. So if we look uh, more carefully to this data published in Nature Physics, we can see that there were, so I consider here only the data that they obtained in pulse field. So their data obtained in pulse field, they were obtained with very fast pulse field compared to what we have in Toulouse. And we can see in their data, there is uh, some contamination from uh, eddy currents. So there is some heating of the sample during the pulse because the pulse is very fast. And eddy current is a current in the sample which is induced by the field variation. So the current is proportional to DHDT. And it's a transversal current. So this leads to heating. And you can see, for instance, here in the data at 20 degrees, there is a large hysteresis at low field and also in high field. And if you look at the superconducting phase and use in field, it's only observed for falling fields. For rising field, the sample is too warm. There is the metamagnetic transition. It's only called when you cool down, when you decrease the field. And you can see here also at low field, the critical field is high when you, could, when you reduce the field, but it's almost zero when you increase the field. And you can see this depends on the angle. So probably this depends on the surface of the sample exposed to the magnetic field. At 24 degrees, the effect is not so big. You can see uh, at uh, the hysteresis is smaller. But for the field along B, there is no red chance in their data 
also it uh, was measured at 450 mK. So there should be reentrance before HM. Yes, there is none. So it's simply due to eddy current. Second point is that if you look to the resistance at zero, uh, the, the resistance in the supercontinuity phase, it's not zero. So it's not 100% uh, uh, sure proof of superconductivity. Of course, we believe there is superconductivity. It's rather clear for all of us. But we needed to confirm that by uh, a clean data with reservoir resistance. So this was our uh, target here. Yeah. To repeat this experiment at 30 degrees with uh, no eddy current or limited eddy current and to have also zero resistance here. Yeah. So the target is to use uh, slow pulses. We have slow pulses in Toulouse. So this is a good ingredient for uh, a low temperature experiment in pulse field. Then we have to play with the thermalization of the sample that we know how to do and also with the geometry of the sample. So we have to reduce the surface exposed to the field by uh, choosing the appropriate samples. So here, just I show you again the pulse field profile. So they are rather long, more than 100 milliseconds. So this is very comfortable condition and normally this is good enough to avoid eddy current. And here I show you some set of data obtained for the field along B. The color corresponds to the falling field and gray corresponds to rising field. And you can see there is almost no difference for the different set of temperature. So the smallest temperature is 200 mK or 600 mK you can see here. And you can see there is almost no hysteresis. So it's okay. I think we are not polluted by eddy current or they are negligible. Here are the data. So first thing is that we confirm uh, for the field along B that we have field and use superconductivity only at field smaller than HM. So this is this arrow here at field along B. We label this phase SC1 and SC2. I will come back to that uh, just after. And we go on the right panel for an angle of around 30 degrees. So this corresponds one to plot this phase here, yeah, the field and use phase in the polarized regime. And we confirm that we have zero resistance. This is very important. And we also confirm that we have field and use superconductivity only in field bigger than HM. So we are very happy. And uh, benefiting from uh, our experiment in uh, controlled temperature, we are confident in the phasogram we can extract in the temperature I make it field phasogram. So here I show you the two phasogram obtained for the two field directions. So first for the field along B, you can see that the field and use reinforcement of superconductivity here in blue is uh, limited by a boundary, which is almost vertical in this phasogram. And this corresponds to the extrapolation of HM in the high temperature part. So it's very striking boundary. So superconductivity does not survive in the polarized paralytic region for this field direction. And what is very striking is for the second direction at 30 degrees is the opposite. Superconductivity, the field and use superconductivity is stable only in field higher than HM. So, and it's again a vertical boundary which extrapolate, which corresponds to extrapolation of HM. So this is very striking, I think. So the question that we may have to try to understand, I will not give you the answer, yeah, but the question that we may have to try to understand why we have such so different behavior for the two field directions. So we expect that under magnetic field, we will change magnetic fluctuation spectrum. So probably, uh, this is my speculation, but I will come to that a bit after. I speculate that the magnetic field leads to a, a, a collapse of antiferromagnetic fluctuation and to a sharp enhancement of ferromagnetic fluctuation at the metamagnetic transition. I will explain you why I speculate this thing. We can also expect some strong changes of the Fermi surface at HM, as uh, it has been observed in many heavy Fermi systems. And we can expect a change from heat around F electron in the correlated parametric regime to localize F electron in the polarized regime. So this is the expectation we can have. We can also expect a change of balance, even if in general the we'll change of balance is tiny, but this is something we can expect. And we can also expect other effects. And uh, only the future will tell us what is the important uh, effect. But anyway, these are the possible effects that are in play. So the first thing, if we consider the high temperature part of our data, so I come back to our resistivity data, but only a temperature from 4 Kelvin to uh, 60 or 80 Kelvin. Here I compare the two directions again. There is no more superconductivity because we are at high temperature. And what you can see is that the 
there is a difference between the two sets of data. It's uh, the field scale for the field along bit transition that satisfies Tesla. At 30 degrees, the transition has moved up to 45 Tesla. But this is the mainly the only difference in the two sets of data. If you rescale the data, they will correspond almost to each other. And so now, if we decrease a bit the temperature, now we look to the, again, the normal state above the superconducting temperature, but we plot rho versus t square, And we extract, in fact, uh, Fermi liquid behavior. The data are consistent with the t square behavior for all set of temperature within experimental uncertainty, but it's compatible with t square behavior. So from that, we can make a fit, Fermi liquid fit, and we can extract the A coefficient, which is shown here on the left for the two fit direction. And what you can see is that uh, for both cases, it's rather symmetric. So it's maximum at HM here and here, but rather symmetric, meaning that the A coefficient is enhanced in a similar way on both sides of HM, meaning that the magnetic fluctuations seem to be present on both sides of HM in a similar way for the two field directions. So there is not a large enhancement, a very large enhancement only in the price regime at 30 degrees and only in the CPM regime. At the, uh, for the field but no, it's uh, rather symmetric. So the very big difference between the two superconducting phase is not related to the magnetic fluctuation. Even so, we believe the magnetic fluctuation are probably leading to the superconducting mechanism. So here, in the, I move to the discussion of this data. So uranium detail right. So first, for the field along B, it looks very similar to what was observed in uranium, rhodium, germanium. So there is difference. Uranium detriorite is a paramagnetic compound. Uranium, uranium rhodium, germanium is a ferromagnetic compound. But nevertheless, you look at the magnetization, you have a first order transition here at certified Tesla. You have also a first order transition here. In both cases, this is a hard magnetic axis. You have an enhancement uh, of the A coefficient, so of the fluctuation, magnetic fluctuation at HM in both cases. And you have this superconducting phase, which is limited to fit smaller than HM in uranium detriorite. And in uranium, rhodium germanium, it extends a bit above HM, but it's mainly in the regime below HM also. So there is some similarity. So now I will have to discuss just one point because here I label the transition. So I consider only the field along B. I consider two phases, SC1, SC2, but in fact, we have no proof there is a phase separation between both. Perhaps SC2 is just the same phase uh, with an enhancement of the coupling parameter. So this is something which is, has not been proven. But nevertheless, I label with two, uh, with SC1, SC2, assuming there is perhaps a phase transition. So I show you some indications. So first indication is if you consider temperature pressure phase diagram obtained by uh, Daniel Boyce-White in Grenoble from heat capacity, what he saw is that uh, it could separate two phases, SC1 in low pressure, and you see that SC1 vanishes almost with a TC varying linearly with pressure. And it is replaced by a second superconducting phase with a very high TC under pressure going up to three Kelvin, it's very high value for AB Fermion systems. So it showed there are two phases, a C1 at low pressure, a C2 at high pressure. And then there is this experiment by Lin push, put on archive. It's a TDO experiment in fields combined with pressure. And they also obtain the evidence of two superconducting phase. There is an anomaly in the TDO, so marked by a kink here. You can see that it's too small. But... And this is an experiment at 4, giga, 4 kilobar up to 14 kilobar in this graph. And what you can see is that in, at 14 kilobar, they label, they obtain only one phase up to HM. HM has been reduced to 15 Tesla. They label by SC1, so it's not consistent with the notation from West White, so I prefer to label that SC2 for consistency. But they have only one phase. This phase corresponds to the high pressure phase. So it seems that the high pressure phase is stable up to HM under pressure. Yeah. And then when you decrease the pressure, SC2 is here and then here. And it seems that SC2 corresponds to the high field phase. And SC1 appear. So by continuity of the phase diagram, everything indicates that uh, SC2 may be the same induced under magnetic field, maybe the same phase and the phase induced under pressure. Of course, we need to have confirmation by uh, a probe, thermally probe, at ambient pressure that there is a phase separation here, but I strongly suspect there is a phase separation. 
And there is also this experiment by Thomas, which confirmed the experiment by Boyce White, and even more, he saw a double transition at ambient pressure. So the question is, uh, assuming there is a magnetically mediated scenario for superconductivity, the question is, do we have thermatic fluctuations or do we have antiferromagnetic fluctuations? So from the original paper by Ron, the proposition was that we have thermatic fluctuation because we have a large enhancement of sensitivity for the field along A, and also because of this scaling plot, M over T versus H over T, 3 half. This was the idea that this is a signature of thermatic fluctuation. However, if we consider the same data but differently, now we make uh, 1 over T versus T for the three field directions. And you can see that the extrapolation of the curie vice flow at high temperature leads to negative curie vice temperature, indicating antiphonic uh, exchange. And if we make another plot, T versus T, but now in log loss scale, so if you start to consider the high temperature regime, if you have thermatic exchange, and if you have thermatic fluctuation developing at low temperature, we will expect an upwards deviation of the subtility. But here, for the three direction, there is a downwards deviation. So this, uh, for me, indicates the possibility of antiphonic fluctuations instead of ferromagnetic for the three directions. Right? So the point is that at least the ferromagnetic fluctuation have not been proved so far to occur at ambient pressure and, uh, and low feed. This is the point. And then there is this paper put on archive very recently, so uh, a few days ago, last week. And you can see it was neutron experiment performed at ambient pressure and uh, zero field. And they have found some antiphonic correlation with the incommensurate wave vector O, 0.57 O. So, and as far as I've seen in the paper, there is no indication of ferromagnetic fluctuation in this measurement. It doesn't prove there are so, but in this measurement, I could see only for anti ferromagnetic fluctuations. So, the question is because the triplet superconducting phase was proposed assuming we have ferromagnetic fluctuations. So, if we have anti ferromagnetic fluctuation, is it still a valid hypothesis? So this is a very uh, interesting question, I think. So then, another to, to discuss this magnetically mediated scenario, we have to look to the magnetic exchange pass. So here I just briefly show you the magnetic structure. And in fact, this structure is compatible with a uh, ladder, um, magnetic ladder structure, you can see here. And the two axes are A axis and C axis of the ladder. So, the two main exchange paths are probably within the ladder, and the question is if these exchange paths are ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic. This, is, uh, this should be determined in the future. So finally, when you apply magnetic fields, so now you consider what happens to the magnetic fluctuations in magnetic fields. So this is what is uh, the ingredient for the field phases SC2 and SCPPM. What we know is that uranium deuteride looks very similar to other heavy ferrant magnets. And if we look the case of serum return to silicon 2, which is perhaps the most documented system in the Fermion family. There is this correlated parametric regime. TK max is 9 Kelvin, HM is 8 Kelvin, and they delimited this correlated parametric regime. And what has been demonstrated by neutron scattering is that you have antiferromagnetic fluctuation in this correlated parametric regime. And this fluctuation collapses exactly at HM. This is all paper already. And they collapse, but they transform into a sharp peak of ferromagnetic fluctuation exactly at HM. So it's a unique study, but this should merit to be repeated for other parametric systems. I believe this is quite general physics, but at least we have these cases where this was proven. So the anti ferromagnetic fluctuation disappear at HM are replaced by ferromagnetic one. Something else is that in this system, the Fermi surface was measured also by the Arsenal Fun experiment, and a change of Fermi surface was shown very sudden change at HN. And the interpretation of this data was that the F electron from itinerant in the correlated regime become uh, localized in the polarized parametric regime. And there's a change of Fermi surface topology, change of Fermi surface. And also the effective, the cyclotron mass from the band that were measured, there is a maximum at HN. Indicating the mass from the Fermi surface is enhanced at HM, so this might be related to the enhancement of the Fermi of, of the ferromagnetic fluctuation. There is a link. So probably the magnetism is driven by this, the same electron, or at least there is some relationship. We can also look to the valence measurement. So here, surprisingly, at least uh, it appears as a contradiction, but it's not, of course. 
there is almost no valence change at HM. So if you look to the valence, we will say that in all cases, the valence is almost anti-integral valence, and uh, F electrons are nearly localized below HM or above HM. So in fact, all of that is different elements of the same puzzle, but in this puzzle, the Fermi surface plays an important role, that is clear. And these elements also show the F electron duality. They are localized, they are itinerant, in fact, they are both, and this is a very difficult point of, to understand these systems. So a last point before concluding, is if we look to the direction at 25, 30 degrees, where we have this uh, second field and use phase. In fact, if we look to the magnetic structure, there is a direction very near to this direction. It's a uh, direction N, which is normal to the reticular planes O11. And the plane, these planes are presented here. So this direction, these planes correspond to a particular network of the spin ladder. So perhaps there is something related to the spin ladder. And if you look at the recipro reciprocal space, it's also a direction corresponding to the wave vector O11, which is perpendicular to this uh, large part of the Brillouin zone boundary. So perhaps this direction, uh, superconductivity appears here. It's not accidental, but of course, uh, this is just some idea. So finally, here are the conclusions. I let you look into the conclusions, but the conclusion indicate that we have different points. We have the Fermi, the, the magnetic fluctuations. How do they change in magnetic field? So this is a question. We have the Fermi surface. How does it change with magnetic field? The balance also, we can question this change. And we put all of these elements in the, in the app, or it's a puzzle, I don't know how we say. And all of that makes that we have this very striking reinforcement of superconductivity, which is strongly dependent on the angle. Okay, so I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, William. Very nice and very clear talk. Uh, and uh, uh, questions, please. Uh, can I ask? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you for this interesting talk. You spoke a lot about the ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic fluctuations. Why you do not say anything about superconducting fluctuations? About what? About superconductivity? About superconducting fluctuations. Uh, maybe because I'm not expert first. <laughs> no, because uh, I would compare at least uh, uh, you could answer me. The first answer could be that you work with strong enough fields, but um, and which suppress uh, uh, thermal. Uh, superconductive fluctuations. Nevertheless, we know today that uh, exist quantum superconducting fluctuations close to HC2. So I would uh, uh, at least evaluate the strengths of uh, ferromagnetic fluctuations and uh, superconducting fluctuations, uh, taking a look at the um, ginzburg levanuk numbers. So the strength of fluctuations is determined by so-called ginzburg levanuk number. And um, because uh, close to transition, I would not be so categoric uh, which kind of fluctuations uh, are very similar, I would say. Okay, so at least to answer you, if we look to the, the resistivity data. So here, yes. Yes. Well, here, here, here I'm, uh, I'm working. Maybe I discuss about magnetic fluctuation because by analogy with many other systems where there is no superconductivity or where there is superconductivity, but it's by analogy, by looking the high temperature resistivity, so rather high, we have some signature, the A coefficient, for instance, mm -hmm. we have many indication of something which is very similar to other systems yeah. where you have magnetic fluctuations and uh, the enhancement of the A coefficient. Uh, can you return? Can you return to the previous slide? Yes. Uh, please take a look at the rho as a function of temperature. I suppose yes. Uh, yes, this is it. yes. And uh, this rounding of transition is typical for superconducting fluctuations. Yeah, yeah, of course. So if you look very close to the superconducting transition, yes. of course uh, there is a rounding. But here the fit was made in a bit higher temperature scale. Of course. This can be polluted because of the rounding. So uh, I agree with you. But uh, from no, this. For the field, 
uh, field um, 50 Tesla will kill anyway. He says yes, of course. But uh, maybe, maybe well, I think uh, the, from uh, what I would expect, I would expect that uh, if you have superconducting transition, of course you have this kind of rounding here. Yes. But uh, very near the superconducting temperature, and here the assumption is that when we are far enough, so of course it's just uh, and uh, approximation, but far enough, uh, I assume this is related to uh, to the magnetic fluctuations. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is uh, one more question from Pablo. Pablo, would you like to ask? Yeah, sorry. I'm curious about how can you control the relative direction of the magnetic field with the crystal structure? You have, if your proofs have only one monolayer or if you have brains? So the, the samples, so the samples were prepared by my colleagues in Grenoble. So they, they were used to cut many of these samples, in fact. So they recognize uh, from the, the, um, the plane, so, to, so the, from the faces of the samples, they recognized the different directions. So for the B-axis, it was uh, rather easy. And it was a bit more difficult for the 30 degrees. So for the 30 degree, I, uh, I started from sample where I know the, the main directions and then I put it some angle. This is just uh, the way I, I proceed in this experiment. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Uh, there is one. Uh... Uh, from Hans Henning, uh, would you like to ask? Yes, yes uh, thank you. So I would like to know if there are uh, high field NMR measurements to look at the night shifts, for example, in the superconducting state, for example, to separate the SC1 from the SC2 phase and look, see the increase of ferromagnetic uh, spin uh, Cooper pairs. So to my... Uh... To my knowledge, up to know, I don't know if there are some experiments. It is sure that people are planning to do that. That is clear. Yeah, sure. But because of the lockdown and everything, and I think without the COVID the crisis, I think you, there will be already some paper on that archive. But, uh, but, but presently, I have no idea of what has been done in Grenoble, in Japan, in the US. I have no idea. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. If there is no more question, let's thank William again, and we can move to the next speaker. Andreas Rost from St. Andrews. He will talk about quantum phase formation driven by multi-critical uh, Lipschitz transition. Uh, hello. Hi. Yes. Can you hear me well? And can you see the shared screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Joseph. Uh, I will talk today about uh, some recent insights. Uh, oh, sorry. Joseph asked me to also start my video. Um, some recent insights on uh, the Rusinates, uh, in particular, Quantum phase, the quantum phase transitions in the roots and nates, and as they are driven by uh, multi-critical Lipschitz transitions. So the work I'm going to talk about is actually falling a little bit into two uh, classes. The theory collaboration in the, in the uh, recent years was uh, primarily with uh, Dimitri Efremov, Claudio Chamon, and, and Joseph, who is sharing also the, the session. The experimental data on which our work is based is actually already a bit older. Uh, it's, it's nearly 10 years old data. Uh, that has been previously published, but uh, reanalyzed for us uh, a little bit more careful. Uh, but that work was done uh, in the group of Andy McKenzie a few years ago, uh, mainly collaborating with Santiago Guigera and uh, Trufo Borsi. In the second part of the talk, I'll, I'll um, talk a little bit about what it means for the surface of 214, the insights that we have gained for the, for the tri there material. And that's mainly work that actually has been done in the group of Peter Wall uh, and Karina Marquesh. I think she's also in the audience. She gave a talk yesterday, which if it was recorded, will be available for you uh, as uh, to, to go to if you're interested in more details about uh, 
the physics uh, of the surface of the, the one four, which I only gonna um, slightly touch up. Okay, so the talk is is focusing on ruthenates. Uh, it's a class of uh, it's a perovskite uh, rather than proper series class of materials. Uh, its members are reasonably well known within the community. Uh, the single layer material is strontium. Oh, oh geez. The single layer material is strontium two one four, which of course has been supposed to be a p-based superconductor in the past. Uh, it's a paramagnet and a highly two D uh, Fermi liquid. At the infinity level, you have strontium one one three, which is a three D itinerant uh, ferromagnet. It's cubic. And in between sits the bilayer material, strontium 3 to 7, on which this talk is focusing. It is still paramagnetic, uh, but it has a quantum critical, a metamagnetic quantum critical point in its phase diagram, which is why it ex ex uh, attracted quite a lot of uh, interest. But it's also a strongly correlated material, as is, for example, evidenced by its Wilson ratio, which is roughly of the order of 10. So this indicates how much magnetic fluctuations dominate over any specific heat enhancements. Uh, and uh, for example, in helium-3, the ratio is only about three. So this is a reasonably strongly correlated uh, magnetic material. Now, what I'm showing here is the phase diagram, uh, temperature as a function of magnetic field of this uh, material. Uh, the underlying overall physics is driven by metamagnetism. So if you were, if you go to, uh, to the, a, if you would apply the magnetic field in the AB a B plane, what you would see is a first order phase transition uh, as a function of applied magnetic field. And so what this means is at high temperatures, you have a magnetization that rises super linear, but continuously at very low temperatures, you have a first order jump and somewhere you have a, a critical endpoint uh, of that first order transition line, just have a critical endpoint in the water uh, where you have liquid to gas transition. Now, if you start in the AB plane and you rotate the magnetic field into the c-axis, so originally you apply the field this direction, then you start rotating it into the c-axis. What you see is this critical endpoint is suppressed towards zero temperature and you end up with a quantum phase transition. Now, around this quantum phase transition, this period of quantum phase transition, what actually happens is phase formation. There's uh, two phases that have been uh, not quite well characterized that uh, appear in a very narrow field and temperature regime uh, masking this quantum critical endpoint. But that's the, so, so the, uh, the metamagnetic transition is the, if you want high energy physics on, on, on energy scales of 10 Kelvin or higher, the phase formation is taking place on tem and, uh, temperature scales of one Kelvin or lower. So there's a uh, separation of energy scales between the metamagnetism and the phase formation. Now, the phase itself has also attracted a lot of interest because it is showing uh, what is now generally called pneumatic transport if you apply uh, a current along a small in-plane magnetic field, what you see is a highly resistive signal. If you apply the current perpendicular to the in-plane field, what you see is a very low resistance signal in the phase A as well as in the B phase. You can define some resistive order parameter and what you see is effectively within the phase, you have a pneumatic transport. Uh, this, uh, that the phase is not just characterized by a uh, transport order parameter, but also by a magnetic order parameter has been shown by neutron scattering, for example, where a characteristic Q vector uh, of a, uh, a spin density wave has been found uh, in the A phase upon 0.233. Uh, it's slightly different in the B phase. Uh, it's a very small intensity, the spin density wave, so it's not clear if it's living on the back of a charge density wave, but there is a clear order parameter that can be defined for these phases that indicates there's also some uh, spin density component associated. Okay, so my work on this material mainly focused on the thermodynamics. So when I did my PhD, we were really interested in what the specific heat is doing when you approach this quantum phase transition. And in particular, are we gonna find any traces of quantum critical enhancement of the specific heat? And so we went away and we studied the entropy of the material, which is what I'm showing on the left-hand side as we, we determined overall the entropy phase diagram as well as the specific heat. And so on the right-hand side, uh, where, you, where we show uh, entropy or specific heat as a function of uh, magnetic field in the critical region, you see that there's a clear strong onset of divergence, both in the specific heat as well as the entropy. Uh, over a certain regime, it's actually quantitatively the same. And that means 
uh, you're, you're dealing with a Fermi liquid regime. And the, uh, on top of that, this divergence is symmetric in field uh, around the quantum phase transition. You see the same divergence on the other side. Now, we didn't want to be limited by, uh, by a theoretical prediction. So we thought, OK, let's do a parameter free as much as we can, assumption free uh, uh, fit to this divergence of a power law, as you would do uh, for a critical divergence uh, at a at phase transition. And when we did this, we got a very clear uh, result that the specific heat is diverging uh, with a power to the minus one. So it's a reasonably strong uh, power law divergence that you see I'm approaching this critical regime. But on the, at the same time, what these measurements showed is that uh, on the left and right, you're definitely dealing with a Fermi liquid regime. And that means there has to be a bent structure. There has to be a dispersion that corresponds to this physics. And of course, a uh, divergence in specific heat, you could also interpret as a Van Hoof singularity. So there are these two possible explanations, therefore, what is happening in the material when you uh, approach uh, the critical field. So in zero field, you start out with a spin unpolarized system that, that has a uh, uh, density of states peak somewhere in its bent structure, and the Fermi energy is sitting away from the density of states peak. Uh, as, uh, as, as it's paramagnetic in zero field, uh, both spin uh, densities have the same uh, energy dependence. Now, of course, if you apply a magnetic field to a bent structure, you always will get some Siemens splitting. And so what is happening is that uh, the minority band is moving towards the Fermi energy, and you see an enhancement of density of states and therefore specific heat due to the Siemens effect. At the same time, it's clear as you're dealing with a quantum phase transition, there have to be quantum critical fluctuations, and those are expected to renormalize the band structure. Now, what does such a renormalization look like? Uh, what it effectively corresponds to is that you're squeezing the states and energy, and you're enhancing, therefore, their density of states. So uh, this is a complete oversimplification, uh, but it's just to, to sketch that these two uh, competing, or both, both of these phenomena can con contribute to the enhancement of the specific heat. So on the one hand, you, you have the traditional Siemens splitting effect. On the other hand, you have the, uh, the strong enhancement from quantum critical fluctuations and the renormalization of the band structure as you approach with the magnetic field as a control meter, the quantum phase transition. However, the prediction from the standard scenario for quantum criticality that has been applied to three to seven would be that the power of the divergence is to the power of minus one third. So that's inconsistent with what we have found uh, in, in the data when we, when we did an assumption free fit to it. Now, of course, then you worry, okay, if it's inconsistent with the quantum critical fluctuations, can it be consistent with the uh, von Hof singularity scenario? And so fortunately, you can explicitly calculate if you know what the divergence in the, uh, in the density of states is, uh, uh, what the resulting divergence in the, uh, in the specific heat is. It's a very straightforward calculation. It involves simply Siemens splitting as well as, as num number conservation, and you can really do it explicitly. And what you find is that a divergence in the specific heat to the power of minus one would have to correspond to a divergence in the um, density of states of the power of minus one half. Now, we are dealing with a quasi 2D material. We know in a quasi 2D material, you can have naturally a Van Hoof singularity uh, uh, for example, on a square lattice, as in the ruthenates. However, that standard Van Hoof singularity is a, uh, is a logarithm. You could then go away and argue, oh, there may be some 1D uh, bands in the material. Uh, you would get a Van Hoek singularity in 1D bands. However, uh, the Van Hoek singularity in a 1D band is extremely asymmetric. It's to the power of one half, but only on one side. And you would really have to construct a very artificial system where you have two 1D Van Hoek singularities that happen to ha happen in the same energy regime and happen to, happen, uh, to be particle hole symmetric. And that is really a constructed, uh, well, going well because beyond Oaken's razor. It's really a, a construction that we couldn't believe is reasonable in the, in the system. So our original conclusion in 2009 was therefore that generic 2D Van Hoof singularity scenarios can also not give rise to the power law that we see in this specific. So now we were sitting on this conundrum where, okay, there is a maybe not fully developed quantum uh, phase transition theory that doesn't explain it. And we don't, uh, and the traditional, um, uh, Siemens splitting doesn't explain it either, uh, but more likely what we're seeing is the effects of the quantum phase. 
Now, fast forward a few years uh, to, uh, to the work with, uh, with um, Claudio and with uh, Joe and Dimitri. We revisited what really happens in the vent structure because there was also strong improvement in the DFT calculations describing the material and it became possible to go beyond uh, the simple uh, assumptions that, that you typically make when you, when you write on a 2D type binding model. Now, just to, to, to give you an overview of what's relevant in the system. So uh, if the, the basic uh, building blocks is a ruthenium oxide square lattice, so you have ruthenium atoms sitting in a ruthenium oxide octahedra interspaced with strontium atoms. The relevant orbitals at the Fermi energy are almost uh, exclusively ruthenium uh, uh, d orbitals uh, of the TGOG manifold, and those are the ZX, YZ, and XY uh, orbitals that are responsible for the in-plane, uh, uh, for the quasi-2D uh, uh, nature of the material. Now, uh, the, this square lattice, of course, is also the starting point for strontium-214, and indeed, on this square lattice in strontium-214, uh, you, you find at the Fermi energy, uh, Van Hoof singularities, uh, that are sitting at, at, at the end points in that uh, prion zone and that are giving rise to enhanced density of states peak that uh, yesterday was also mentioned extensively, uh, for example, in the talk by Clifford Hicks, uh, which I'm not sure we recorded, but I think we did. So you could, uh, so please uh, go, go back and have a look at, at, uh, at his talk from yesterday. Okay, what happens in three to seven is a little bit more complicated. The ruthenium oxide octahedra are actually rotating. They're rotating uh, pairwise, clock, uh, clockwise, and counterclockwise. Now that is leading to a doubling of the uh, of the prion zone. They're doing so in a slightly complicated manner. If you look at the at the full unit cell, you can see that there's alternating patterns of these rotations throughout. But really, uh, what is most important is this, uh, what happens in the, in the single uh, layer and the doubling of the unit cell that goes away uh, along with that layer. Now, if you, if you look uh, at the, what that should do to the Fermi surface, uh, you can very easily uh, motiv uh, motivate that effectively what is happening due to the root to, to reconstruction is a halving of the prion zone. And you end up with a, with a, slightly, uh, with a reconstructed Fermi surface that also in includes bilayer splitting. In three to seven, that looks massively complicated. But importantly, the Van Hoof singularity physics close to the endpoint is surviving in three to seven, uh, which is now in this new unit cell called the X point, of course. So you have high density of state peaks around the X point that originate from the same bands as in strontium 214 giving rise to the uh, Van Hoof singularity. Okay, however, it's not as simple as that because what is happening now is you're moving your Van Hoof singularity point that was previously sitting at a C2 symmetric uh, uh, part of the, of the uh, prion zone to a point in the prion zone that actually has, C4, has actually fourfold symmetry. And in addition, you allow it to slightly move away from the high symmetry point. You actually split the Van Hoof singularity into four slightly uh, off-centered uh, Van Hoof singularities. Now, that means you're, you're changing the point group of the, uh, of the singularity, and it, in particular, it, it means you're changing the symmetry of the allowed uh, low energy expansion. Uh, in this system. Now, you can describe this mathematically. For example, uh, you can uh, write down a coordinate system uh, where you now are allowed to have a uh, to the power of fourth term in the expansion, or you can describe it also in the Cartesian system. It doesn't really matter which one you choose, uh, but there is, a, there is effectively a, uh, a parameter that parameterizes the uh, size of the quadratic perturbation versus the, the quartic term. And as a function of these, uh, of these parameters, you can end up in a, in a rather complicated Fermi surface and Van Hoof singularity uh, uh, situation. In particular, you can end up in a situation where you have uh, no Van Hoof singularity, or you end up in a situation where the Van Hoof singularities have effectively moved away uh, from the, uh, from the uh, high symmetry point and are sitting in between Fermi surface pockets. Now, strontium 3 to 7, just to give you an idea where we are sitting, uh, in this system, uh, uh, roughly, it is in, in this energy regime here, in this regime of the, uh, of the, um, in this regime of the, 
a phase diagram, theoretical phase diagram. So we are very close to this uh, multi-critical uh, transition point where uh, effectively you have a very, very flat uh, dispersion at the Van Hoek singularity that is dominated by, uh, by a power four uh, term. Now, what is the impact of this on the, uh, on the divergence in the, in the um, density of states? Ultimately, if you look at very, very low energies, of course, you're still dealing with a saddle point system. Uh, your Van Hoek singularity, or your, your critical points are still saddle points in a 2D system, so they still have a logarithmic divergence. So when the chemical potential is much, much smaller than a critical one, uh, you will see a logarithm. However, at higher energies, when you're, uh, uh, when you're above this critical chemical potential, what you realize is that actually what you're dealing with and at this multi-critical Lifshitz point is now a power law divergence that is to the power of minus one half. So by, by changing from this, uh, by, simply by having this reconstruction of the prion zone uh, and the perturbation terms associated with it, you suddenly have been able to change the power of the divergence in the density of states. And that's of course quite a strong argument from a, uh, from a basic fundamental uh, theoretical point of view. Crucially, if this is true, it would actually be consistent with our specific heat observation. So now we are faced with a situation where we, we have a theory that would uh, generically produce a uh, power law that is consistent with our specific heat uh, within the, uh, the framework of the band structure and, and, uh, and of the uh, crystal structure of strontium 3 to 7. Uh, of course, there is this, uh, this nagging uh, doubt uh, what exactly this uh, chemical, critical chemical potential is, and if this uh, theory is really relevant to three to seven. So we went away and we looked closer at the uh, tight binding model and the DFT calculation. And of course, now DFT calculations have massively advanced in the last 10 years. And without wanting to go into details, what I'm showing you here is just the DFT calculation uh, for three to seven for the band structure. In red, I'm showing you on large energy scales where the, in the band structure, the important part is happening. We have created a tight binding model. We have derived a tight binding model from the DFT calculation uh, with a few parameters that we can control easily. And I'm, I'm showing you in the middle just the output of the binding model to convince you that it, uh, that it gets uh, the most uh, important parts right. And crucially, you can, in a tight binding model, you can switch off some orbital contributions. So if you switch off all the dyz and dzx contributions, you still have the Van Hoof singularity uh, bands uh, that are important for the Van Hoof singularity. So these are completely dominated by the dxy band. So the Van Hoof singularity is pure dxy physics. Now, uh, let's look a little bit at lower energy scales. Uh, on the left-hand side, I'm showing you again, oh, sorry, on the right-hand side, I'm showing you the DFT calculation output. On the left-hand side, uh, the tight binding model output. And again, this is just to show you that over, uh, overall, we get uh, the, the structure of the band structure uh, very, uh, very well reproduced in the tight binding model. And the important Van Hoof singularity in the system is sitting just below the Fermi energy. Of course, this is a strongly correlated material. So the tight binding model gets bandwidths uh, uh, wrong. So in order to compare to the actual uh, uh, real material, you have to then take the tight binding model and adjust the parameters so that you can reproduce uh, the band structure of the real material. Fortunately enough, this uh, strontium 3 to 7 has been extensively studied also by ARPES. Uh, and uh, there has been a very nice work by uh, Milan L in 2013, where he summarized effectively all the knowledge that has been gained about the band structure from ARPES. So we have very good uh, uh, detailed information of that. Uh, on the right hand side, you see the Fermi surface that ARPES has determined, as well as the, the schematic uh, of the Fermi surface extracted from that. And crucially, ARPES has found this saddle point, the lift, uh, this Van Hoof singularity just below the Fermi energy but it's rather sitting at minus five uh, milli electron volt roughly, uh, instead of the energy scales of minus 20 milli electron volt that we have seen in the DFT card. Now, but as I said, we can take this ARPES data and we can uh, perfectly uh, fit our, uh, our tight binding model to that ARPES data, which is what I'm showing you here. So the, uh, the dots are uh, the ARPES data extracted from the, uh, uh, from the previous paper. Uh, uh, the dashed lines are the uh, tight binding model uh, that has been fitted to this ARPES data. Uh, the red lines, the red uh, band structure dispersions, are the ones that are relevant uh, for the Van Hoof singularity. 
And now, of course, if you have a tight binding model, uh, you can straight away calculate the density of states of this model. And this is what I'm showing you on the right-hand side here. This is uh, the density of states as a function of energy distance to the Van Hoof singularity. And what you see here is that you have a very nice power law behavior in this log log plot. And uh, we didn't fit it, but I'm just showing you for comparison uh, uh, the power law that you would expect for uh, power minus one half uh, divergence. So really in strong from three to seven over a relevant energy regime from about one milli electron volt to 10 milli electron volt, the divergence in the Van Hoof singularity really behaves like a power law divergence rather than the locker. And so this is now consistent with what we observed in the, uh, in the, in the uh, specific heat measurements as well. Okay, now you could get the impression that what I'm telling you is that, oh, there is no quantum criticality in this material and everything in the Fermi liquid regime below the critical point in the specific heat enhancement, you can understand uh, based on, on, uh, on Siemens splitting only. To some extent, that's true, but it doesn't mean that quantum fluctuation do not play a role. It rather is just that in this regime, the Siemens splitting dominates the specific heat. The quantum critical fluctuations, of course, still must exist in this material, uh, and they, must, they, they should in particular play a role for the specific heat in the, uh, as a function of temperature when you approach the, uh, the critical point as a function of temperature. And they would, of course, play a much stronger role if you could suppress the A and B phase and approach the critical point uh, much closer in magnetic. Uh, but it's simply a statement here that over the regime uh, uh, below seven Tesla, more than half a Tesla away from the critical point, we are, we are almost certainly still dominated by the Siemens splitting form uh, in the, in the uh, specific heat and half. Okay, uh, but this multi-critical Lifshitz point has also a crucial uh, importance for the uh, stabilization of of the aim and in general for the thermodynamic stability of these phases that emerge as a function of magnetic field. And uh, what is important to realize here is that the point at which you uh, enter these phases is uh, to some extent uh, dominated not just by the magnitude of the density of states peaks, it is also dominated by the, by the shape of the density of states. And just to give you a feeling for why that might be, uh, uh, if you, I would like to remind you of the stoner picture simply of ferromagnetism, so not phase formation, but just the metamagnetic transition. Uh, Wolford and Rhodes in, in 62 actually developed uh, a criterion of at which point you would act, we would actually undergo the first order metamagnetic transition if you would apply, uh, if you would uh, spin split uh, the Fermi surface. And they found that the first order phase transition as a function of field would actually occur if a criterion is fulfilled that involves the derivatives and the curvature of the density of states, not just uh, the, the magnitude. Uh, so bottom line is, if you go from a weak logarithm to a strong power law divergence, you're almost certainly guaranteed that you're strongly boosting the susceptibility towards phase formation and to the thermodynamic stability of these phases. So that it, it plays a role not just for, uh, uh, for the specific heat enhancements when you approach the phase, but it also plays a role in stabilizing these, quantum, uh, the, these new quantums with the unconventional order. Okay, uh, there's one more little point that I would like to make about the phase formation. And I told you previously that in this A phase, neutron scattering found a scattering vector that's roughly 0.233 of the prion zone. Um, and that, that vector is, uh, uh, that scattering uh, is, a, is an order parameter for the A phase. Now, if you were just to look at the DXY only band, in which we have the multi-critical Lifshitz points uh, and where you have the Van Hoof singularity sitting here, you wouldn't actually find a characteristic scattering vector associated uh, with that length scale. However, if you switch on the DXZ and DY side bands, they hybridize uh, with the DXY bands and you obtain these very flat, very straight parts of the Fermi surface that are nearly perfectly nested. And they are nested by exactly this vector. So the bottom line of that is the Van Hoof singularities in the multi-critical Lifshitz point is driving the thermodynamic stability of these phases. But the order parameter that's actually realized in the phase depends on orbitally different parts of the Fermi surface. So they, have, they, they, they only belong here to the same uh, uh, Fermi surface or con contour of constant energy because uh, the bands hybridize, 
But if you were look, to look at the orbital uh, uh, component, you would really find that these flat bit, bats, bits here are pure dx set, dy set character, whereas what is giving you the uh, density of states enhancement is pure dx, uh, dxy character. So this is an interesting point uh, that is effectively uh, saying that there's one mechanism that gives you a large density of states, and there's another part of the Fermi surface that determines what phase you actually end up in. Okay, this was on strontium three to seven. If it was only a theoretical uh, uh, approach that would be relevant to this material class, it wouldn't uh, probably be uh, of interest to more than a, a few people uh, in, the, in, the, in the more specialized community. But you find these multi-critical uh, uh, Lifshitz conditions actually across a large number of uh, classes where unconventional density waves or uh, unconventional order parameters have been found. They do exist in potassium ion, uh, ion to arsenic too, for example, where the uh, multi-critical uh, uh, Van Hoof singularities are, are situated here. You can find them in transition metal dichalcocanoids, in particular here in venatium diselenide, a monolayer system where you have uh, a multi-critical Lifshitz point move away slightly from the gamma point. And you can find them in the uh, in bilayer graphene and also in the more recent Moray uh, uh, bilayer uh, versions of, of, of graphene, where you have monkey settles uh, in which you have Lifshitz transitions at a multi-critical uh, Lifshitz transition, this time around the threefold symmetric point where the Lifshitz transition has moved away slightly uh, from the high symmetry point. So in all these systems, uh, you, you therefore deal with the potential that the uh, strength of the divergence is significantly different from what you would expect typically in a 2D material. Okay, in the last few minutes, uh, let me quickly come back to Stronson 214, the monolayer compound. So originally I showed you this uh, image of the perfect lattice of, Stronson, of, a, of a layer of Stronson 214, and it has this uh, traditional logarithmic uh, divergence in, uh, in the uh, density of states to this Van Hoof singularity situated at its endpoint. So the Van Hoof singularity would be here. Now, it's long been known that the uh, ruthenium octa uh, oxygen octahedra on the uh, surface are actually rotated by a similar degree of rotations in the bilayer compounds from 3 to 7. So what you end up with is you have a bulk material that is 2D with unrotated uh, 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 octahedra, and you have a surface state which is reconstructed just like the band structure in Stronson 3 to 7 due to the ruthenium oxide octahedra rotation. Now, I will show you at the end that that similarly leads to a pneumatic phase on the surface of 214, but let me uh, slowly walk you through the, uh, through the uh, logic behind this. Okay, so what you see here is uh, a recent STM measurement that has been taken uh, by Karina Makresh uh, that gave her talk yesterday. Uh, there's also an archive paper uh, that I would li uh, like to point you to, uh, but by all means, please go and listen to her talk if you didn't have the chance yesterday. Uh, now, this is the uh, proposed surface structure uh, of, of 214, and this is the corresponding STM uh, uh, data. Because of the rotation, you see a root 2, root 2 reconstruction of the prion zone. If you looked at the STM data, you could say, okay, I also see a root 2, root 2 reconstructed prion zone uh, from this original one. And therefore, yes, the STM data shows that reconstruction. But these are intrinsically different reconstructions. And let me show you why. The key point is when you tunnel an STM into this material, you're tunneling on the strontium side. So the atomic positions you're seeing here are strontium positions, and they're physically an equivalent, as you can see, in the intensity of the STM uh, tunneling signal. Uh, in, this, yeah, in this case, in the, inten uh, in the height of the topography. Now, the implications of this is that every second strontium site is inequivalent, physically in, in equivalent from the other strontium sites. And in particular, that means if I look at one oxygen here, there's an oxygen site that is sitting close to, uh, uh, to a gray strontium, but it is sitting far away from a, from a green strontium. Okay? And of course, uh, that's true for the other oxygen site, and it's true for all these blue oxygen sites. All these blue oxygen sites are very close to the gray strontium. There's, of course, also a, a second oxygen site now, where the second oxygen site is close to a green strontium. 
So to, just to, to point it out again, you simply go from the observation that the strontium atoms are inequivalent to the observation that that must mean that the oxygen sites see a physically inequivalent environment. Okay, and so the bottom line is you have uh, uh, the yellow types of oxygen sites close to the green atoms, uh, strontium atoms, and you have the blue types of oxygen sites close to the gray strontium atoms. This arrangement of oxygen breaks C4 down to C2, and they are physically different. So you would expect that in this C4 material, this surface state has to break that C4 symmetry, and it needs to be a C2 surface state. And one way of seeing that is if these oxygen sites are inequivalent, then of course the, the oxygen, the hopping paths through these oxygens have to be inequivalent. And so you have uh, the orange hopping paths along the y direction, you have the blue hopping paths along the x direction. So the hopping is, is, uh, is different, therefore uh, it must mean that the, that the electronic state is no matter. And indeed, if you carefully look by STM uh, at the electronic structure at low energies, you find that the electronic structure is breaking strongly C4 symmetry at low energy. You can also look at, at quasi-particle interference on longer length scales, and you again find that it is breaking C4 symmetry down to C2. And really, uh, for more details of this pneumatic breaking, uh, have a look at, at Carolina, uh, Carolina's uh, preprint as well as uh, uh, as, uh, as a talk. You can go beyond this, and you can uh, do a tight binding model of this. Uh, you can introduce a phenomenological pneumatic and then see wave order parameter. And you find that if you do that, you not only uh, reproduce the fact that it's a pneumatic state, you can also very well reproduce the density of states as you see it in the STM experiment. So this is the result of the density of states uh, equivalent measurement of the uh, density of states on the surface uh, from the STM experiment. This is the uh, calculated density of states if you introduce a pneumatic order parameter as well as a small density wave gap. And the resulting uh, Fermi surface you see here, again, you have Van Hoof singularities that don't sit anymore at the high symmetry point. They are slightly off the high symmetry point uh, and they are, part of the, uh, they are also therefore uh, part of this multi-criticular shift condition scenario. Okay, with this, uh, two things. I, I wanna leave you and quickly give you a summary of what I talked about. And the first part, I revisited an old problem that we had in strontium 3 to 7, where we discovered that uh, actually what is happening and is crucial in this material is that the uh, Lifshitz transition, the Manhoe similarities, are not sitting right on the high symmetry points. They're slightly off, and they're part of a multi-critical Lifshitz transition. Uh, that results in a power law, uh, a strong boost to the power law divergence from being logarithmic to being a, a square root power law divergence, which can now explain our specific heat data. And I also showed you on strontium 214 on the surface state where you have a similar reconstruction of the prion zone and uh, of the Fermi surface that uh, as in three to seven, you're ending up in a pneumatic state that is strongly breaking a DC4 symmetry down to a C2 symmetry. And you see effectively a, a, a pneumatic electronic structure. Again, with a band structure where the, uh, where the uh, low energy physics is dominated by a multi-critical Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Andreas, for a very ni nice, clear talk. Uh, there, are, there is already uh, one uh, question. Uh, Philip, would you like to, uh, to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, Thanks, Andreas, for the very nice talk. I, Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. OK, yeah. So my question is on the phase diagram of the 3 to 7 system. So yeah. Um, actually, it is a bit more complicated since there is another. Yes, I know. I simplified it. There's a bit more at the low. There's yeah. a bit more at the low. Uh, also, scale. those entropy accumulation. Yeah. So, for instance, we see a sign change in the magnetic Grünheis parameter, and of course, then fitting with just one power law divergence wouldn't work to uh, accommodate different critical fields. Mm. And so, I don't think one can really exclude that the field dependence of thermodynamic properties is not governed by quantum criticality. Because if you allow for multiple critical fields, you can well describe the entire phase diagram on the basis of the quantum criticality. Okay, so, um, so the fits were only done up to uh, seven Tesla, so they're staying well away from the complicated part at 7.5 Tesla. Where, uh, so the 7.5, so the additional, 
So what what uh, what Philip is uh, alluding to is there's an additional oh, sorry there's an additional um, phase or physics appearing. Okay, red on red doesn't work very well, uh, unfortunately. Uh, appearing here, the fits for the power law effectively stop well before that, um, and they, they we make sure by only fitting the regime where where delta s over t and c over t are equivalent that we stay well within the Fermi liquid regime where it's possible to do the power law. Now, okay, so the moment you go to four more and more complicated things, of course, uh, yes, if you had two or three power laws fit into it, uh, you can probably uh, describe everything uh, that, that any kind of, uh, of data. But the point here really is that uh, in this, where we're quite sure that we see only the, the high energy physics and we're dominated by that in the, in the specific heat uh, direction, that there is a simple picture that is actually consistent with all the ARPIS data that's consistent with the, uh, with, the, uh, if, with the band structure that you expect, that gives you the correct uh, divergence in the specific heat based just from the density of states that you observe in zero field. That, that's pretty much the, the, the baseline. Yes, there might be other complications or so, but using Ockham's razor, if I have a zero field band structure, it's that I have experimentally de uh, 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 determined uh, and I can extract the density of states uh, divergence of that band structure. And it would predict me a power law to a minus one divergence. And I see a power law di minus one divergence in the data. Then it's hard to, 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 to argue for uh, additional effects uh, going beyond that also being, being relevant for the explanation. And it's not just an agreement in terms of, uh, of a power law, it's actually also in, in magnitude. Yes. Other questions? Yeah, uh, Clifford? Yes. Um, thank you for the talk, Andreas. Uh, I wanted to ask more about the link between uh, metamagnetism and the density wave phase. Uh, so in this nesting that you show um, uh, right here on this slide in the bottom yeah. center, uh, the density wave phase in theory would be determined by the joint density of states across that nesting vector the metamagnetism uh, by the uh, position of the Van Hoop singularities in the uh, center with respect yes. to the Fermi level. Um, so these seem formally to be different things, and I wonder why, uh, can you say more about why we get the density wave order uh, right where we have the metamagnetism? Um, so the system wants to deal, do something with it. Okay, so the, the, the comic Mickey Mouse picture of this is the, the system wants to do something with this density of states, right? All system stability start diverging when the specific heat or the density of states diverges, right? Mm -hmm. Then it's a question of which order parameter wins. And of course, which density wave gets stabilized will depend uh, not just on the fact that you have a large density of states, it will also depend what are in the bare susceptibility, which, uh, where are the enhancements already there based on, on, on nesting features on the band structure, right? And so in a, in a um, second order theory where effectively uh, that density wave is coupling to the fluctuations coming from the uh, Lischitz transitions, you, you enhance all orders and it's just a question which one wins, right? So in some, in some sense, it's, it's the same as, okay, so my personal view, and that might be uh, too, too oversimplifying is, when you try to find out which superconducting order parameters you calculate them all and you see which converges fastest, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so in some sense, this is what happens here as well, probably. You have many, you have susceptibilities to, to several different possible density ways because this is not the only possible nesting vector in the system, right? The system wants to order and the question is which one wins. And it, it picks out this, this one. Um, maybe coming quickly back, uh, one more comment on, on Philip. I'm, I really don't want to leave the impression that quantum critical fluctuations don't play any role, role in the system because clearly it does, it, it is close to a quantum phase transition and, uh, and, and they must be uh, somewhere in the phase diagram. All I was trying to say is over the regime where we can uh, really fit the, uh, the density of states, they don't dominate yet. We have to go much closer to the quantum phase transition. Uh, to, to get to the point where the quantum fluctuations will dominate. 
but I'm not saying they are not there. They must play a role in the overall physics of the system. If I can uh, add a quick comment, uh, the uh, situation is uh, uh, more complicated, if you see, uh, because there are also other uh, competing very close to this uh, value of the nesting vector. There are other parts of the Fermi surface uh, that can be within uh, some uh, uh, small error. Uh, you, you can... Uh, you can connect them through the same uh, Q vector. And um, the question, the real question to, uh, to which uh, Cliff uh, asked basically is, once you have the onset of the singularity and the enhanced density of states, then you have scattering from that, if you want, hot spot uh, to other parts uh, and uh, the, the question is which one wins? Why this SDW can be enhanced or not? Moreover, to make things even more complicated, these um, nesting parts that uh, 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 Andreas uh, shows have only one kind of spin, while the other parts have both kinds of spins. The other part that I'm referring to and that and Andreas uh, do not show here, that are also connected by the same Q vector, have both uh, spin up and speed down, if you want. So it is effectively a Hamiltonian that breaks as U2 symmetry. And then you ask, okay, once the, the, uh, this uh, enhancement of uh, the density of states because of this, uh, multi uh, critical uh, Fermi surface topological transition happens, what will happen to different kinds, how, how the scattering would affect different as possibilities of uh, SDW. So it's a little bit more, I mean, I find that, uh, I don't know, uh, 214 is very complicated from the point of view of superconductivity, but 327 is also uh, extremely complicated from the point of view of all this phase formation and uh, and uh, unusual uh, topological transitions, etc. So it's it's uh, it's uh, uh, a little bit more complicated and more work is is uh, necessary, I believe. Yes. A any other uh, any other question? Maybe one one more comment I would make to like to make to Clifford. Uh, this might go some way of explaining why some materials are nesting, even though if you just look at the at the nested parts themselves without con considering the rest of the band structure, you would conclude, oh, why why is this nesting leading to a density wave? Right? It shouldn't the energies energetics aren't good enough? Um, I mean, these aren't very big Fermi surface parts here, right? You wouldn't really expect them. Uh, on top of that, the Q vector is, is, is uh, dispersing as a function of energy, right? So why would it particularly pick out that Q vector for nesting? Exactly. Uh, and it's, it's almost certainly this, this interplay of that nest, uh, of, of the uh, divergence in the specific heat together with uh, density of states together with the existence of the nesting vector that is ultimately stabilizing the phase. But the nesting vector in itself would not stabilize. Very good. So. Let, thank you very much, Andreas, and uh, let me uh, introduce the next speaker who has another talk, at a different session. So, uh, apologies, Andre, for this delay. Uh, the next speaker is Andre uh, Varlamov, uh, who is going to talk about uh, uh, transport spectroscopy of the field-induced cascade of Lipschitz transition in YRS. Oh, Joseph, thank you very much. Uh, can I share screen? Please. Yeah, okay. So uh, this is, uh, um, uh, one moment only, ah, okay. Uh, so hello everybody. <clears throat> I want to speak about the transport spectroscopy of the field induced cascade of Lipschitz transitions in uh, Ethereum uh, RHC2. And this will be continuation in some sense, application of the results of Gertrude uh, in the 
to the experiments of um, Alexander and his group uh, on Zeebeck anomalies. And uh, I will start from a little bit of history. So what are Lipschitz transitions? They were introduced first time, let's say, uh, in 1960. He had some pre uh, predecessors. Uh, so uh, Ilya Mikhailovich Lipschitz, this is a brother of Eugenie Lipschitz, who is famous by Landau Lipschitz course. Uh, so he noticed that when you have the change of the number of components of um, uh, 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 topology in, uh, for instance, the break of the neck of uh, uh, um, hyperboloid or formation of the new void, something happens with density of states. What happens? Uh, happens, uh, let's consider uh, the example of formation of new void. In three-dimensional case, you can easily see that you have uh, from one side of the transition, so when void still did not form, uh, the, this correction delta rho is zero, but when it just formed from simple formulas of Fabry theory, you will find that the correction to density of states has a square root um, uh, uh, singularity, not singularity, uh, okay. Um, so let's say singularity uh, um, uh, close to the critical point. We can characterize this transition by the parameter Z, which is uh, the value of Fermi energy or chemical potential at zero temperature is the same to the critical point. So the uh, finding of Lipschitz was that such change in the density of states is a combined in the appearance of the term Z in power five over two in thermodynamical potential. We speak about zero temperature. I want to recall you that uh, Ehrenfest in 1933 introduced classification of the phase transitions and he uh, identified the uh, order of phase transition with the number of derivative which breaks at this transition. So in the first phase, the uh, order phase transition, the entropy bre uh, breaks. You pass from uh, crystal to liquid or from liquid to gas. Uh, in the second order transition, heat capacity breaks, the second uh, derivative. And here, two and a half phase transition means that you have the square root singularity. So uh, entropy does not break, but its derivative is, uh, 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 breaks. So you can expect some singularity in the coefficient of thermal extension. So actually in 1960, um, this paper, which was published in Soviet JET, was um, accepted positively, but it did not create some, because you do not have singularities actually. So in what physical value? In thermodynamics, you have singularities in such exotic things like the coefficient of thermal extension. Uh, you can easily study the thermodynamic of the electronic uh, topological transition just writing the density of states by the simple definitions as a um, uh, derivative of the volume of brilliant zone which with energies less than uh, uh, energy Fermi and then calculate corresponding uh, density of states you can calculate number of uh, the concentration of particles and correspondingly integrating with Fermi distribution, you can calculate the value of thermodynamical potential. So this type of extension of Lipschitz transition on final temperatures is trivial. And you see that instead of mm, uh, uh, just Z in power five over two, and zero from other side, you have some exponential tail uh, from the uh, in region one and some temperature dependent correction to Z in power five over two. What corresponds to Lipschitz results? You can extend all this on the non-ideal crystal introducing the smearing of Fermi surface due to the scattering on impurities. Uh, actually, the first very significant experimental result belongs to, uh, belongs to 
um, Valery Yegorov, you see here um, him, and he found that in Liti 1 minus X magnesium X alloy changes the concentration of magnesium, uh, he found that uh, at uh, room temperatures nothing happens. At uh, the nitrogen temperature you have some peak, but this peak becomes very pronounced. You see that practically 30 times. Uh, so he found the anomaly in, thermo in uh, Zebe coefficient. And uh, this um, uh, experiment actually started the studies of the transport, electron transport close to electric topology contradiction. I will explain you in two words uh, what happens. Uh, in conductivity, when you calculate in the framework of Boltzmann equation conductivity, so you uh, calculate the convolution of the density of states, Fermi velocity and relaxation time with a derivative of Fermi function. For conductivity, uh, so this derivative of Fermi function gives you, so you can consider all numerator are, are constants and integrate just cos, cosine square in denominator and you will have through the formula. The other story with uh, the uh, thermoelectric coefficient. Here, instead of one of charges of the particle, it appears energy. And if you will assume density of states, where Fermi velocity and tau as constants, so you will have just zero. So in order to get non-zero result, you have to uh, be more precise and you have to take into account the electron hole anomaly. So the fine structure of the density of state relaxation time close to the Fermi surface. The result is the well known formula for Zeebeck coefficient. It is small for normal Fermi surface. It, is, it has smallness temperature over mu. Temperature is uh, 300 case, mu is 10,000. So, uh, what happens close to electronic topological transition? Many years ago, in 1985, we with Andrei Pansulaya proposed the microscopic theory of energy dependent scattering uh, as the uh, origin of the giant anomalies in thermoelectric power. Namely, we considered the life of electron on the um, model spectrum, so hyperboloid of rotation, where changing the sign of Z, we can pass Hello, Josep. Yes, I think that we lost the connection with the with the Professor okay. Barlamov. Yes. So maybe we can wait a little bit. Uh, yeah. Okay.
Yeah, that's unfortunate. Uh, can anyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. I thought I I, I had an issue with my internet. Okay, that, uh, that's mm -hmm. probably not the case. Just that uh, Andre uh, Varlamov disappeared. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so probably uh, let's wait another minute and then uh, I think it's better to move to Alexander. Okay. Would you like to share screen? So it's uh, okay. the downside of uh, virtual uh, meetings is what happened, but uh, we can uh, now move to Alexandre Pure from Grenoble. Okay, we try. who will continue the discussion about the new uh, superconductor uranium tellurium 2. I uh, cannot share why. One moment only. Uh, uh, sorry, um, something happened with my uh, internet, so now I'm speaking through the mobile one. Can I share screen? Yes, please. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah. uh, Alex. Uh, so, can I share screen? You disabled. Can I share screen? Yes, now you can. Yes, so sorry for uh, this, and uh, uh, I will now, uh, yeah, I will continue, yes. Uh, sorry for this. So uh, oh, what I want to say, that in uh, the consideration, the microscopic consideration of this scattering process demonstrate that uh, you have in the topological, during the topological transition, you have some peripheric large Fermi surface and uh, the formation of new piece. In result of impurity scatterings, you can uh, start from the periphery to be scattered and to return to the periphery. These processes do not give important contribution to the Beck anomaly. The most important are scatterings where electrons starts from periphery and finishes at the, in the uh, singular uh, point, just newborn void. And this results in the, uh, then we considered the same problem, but for void formation, not the for neck disruption. 
And we found very beautiful thing. Here, it is very clear. You see, these are uh, the normal scatterings which give you small mod result. Such scatterings from large Fermi circuit to small one results in appearance of the additional energy dependent term in relaxation. And this is the origin of mm, uh, giant Ziebeck effect uh, close to the electrotopological position. So uh, uh, you could consider, uh, as was naively uh, speculated at the very beginning, that to have giant Ziebeck coefficient, it is enough to have square root singularity in density of states. Indeed, you have derivative d over d mu of log rho vl, and rho has a square root of z. So when you derive it, you will have one of square root and denominator. But immediately, uh, uh, the um, argument, contra-argument appears that you should multiply this singularity in the derivative of density of states on square of Fermi velocity. And it is very small in the just uh, formed uh, void. While if you consider scatterings from large Fermi surface to small one, you have this singularity in relaxation time, but Fermi velocity appears uh, uh, is taken from large part of Fermi surface. Okay, so with this knowledge, we calculated many years ago the shape of the Z coefficient, and uh, we found that uh, that one for um, uh, neck disruption and void formation are just merely reflected. Uh, so we found that practically it does not matter what kind of form, uh, of uh, electronic topological transition you consider, neck disruption or um, void formation. All is governed by topology. And you can just change z in minus z, omega in minus omega, and consider any transition in the unique way. Uh, then our theory was applied for a variety of uh, different uh, materials like lithium magnesium, bismuth stibium with uh, some impurities of t uh, tellure, molybdenum uranium, and it worked very good. This is the old story of uh, 80s in the beginning of 90s. You can find the details in our review articles in advances in physics with uh, experimentalist uh, Igor and my ex-student Andrei Pansulaya and in the paper with Blanter, uh, who was my student also, and uh, the uh, classic of normal metal theory, Maisei Kaganov, uh, in 1994. Now I will pass to uh, the transport spectroscopy indeed. So you already saw this experiment, Gertrude demonstrated them. And mm, uh, the, in uh, 2017, uh, similar um, uh, experiments were done by a group of FAO, and they found a lot of transitions and explained them, uh, referring on our old theory, just considering each transition as independent one. And they have succeeded to classify what kind of transition takes place. So is it a uh, hole or electron who are carriers? And the type of, uh, by asymmetry of the peak, they could uh, qualify the, uh, uh, the direction in which happens transition. So formation or disruption of the neck, etc. Uh, we, with uh, um, um, Alexander and uh, Sergei Sharapov and all co-authors, decided to use the uh, beautiful uh, the band structure calculations of Gertrude to uh, use them for transport calculation, to, ex uh, to uh, calculate the Z, the coefficient for so complex system, which pass through the series of uh, topological transitions. So uh, actually the hint was 
from band structures, the, the major sheets of the quasi-particle in zero field, then evolution with magnetic field of the critical part of the minority jungle gem sheet. And you can see that you have the series of topological transitions. Uh, of course, to use these true uh, Fermi surfaces was for us impossible for analytical calculations. So the idea was to go to the grocery store and to buy some fruits. Which fruits I bought? It was the watermelon, orange, cherry, and banana. And then why I choose, what does it mean without jokes? This means that watermelon presents the periphery large Fermi surface, which uh, practically does not change. Then the formation of new void was a cherry. The break of the neck of uh, the hyperboloic type was a banana. And relatively large piece of Fermi surface, which with increase of magnetic field decreases, was orange. Very good. So uh, we put in uh, equivalence uh, the calculus of tight band model, uh, renormalization group, uh, we created this model Fermi surface where you can see what happens. In fields less than H1, you have large piece of Fermi surface, which is not Z0. Then you have Z3, orange, which is relatively large. And then you have banana, which still is not broken. And uh, you have nothing here, no cherry. When H passed through H1, cherry appears. Uh, then when H passed through H2, cherry grows and banana is broken. And finally at Z3, uh, uh, disappears orange. And we uh, um, uh, proposed to uh, the, um, the idea is that we take into account not only scatterings from the periphery of, of the large piece of Fermi surface to the small one, but also, and for all of them, but also from this relatively slow, so they speak between themselves. And we took into account all these possible scatterings. Uh, so uh, we considered not three independent phase uh, electronic topological transitions, but how uh, this small sheets of Fermi surface speak without them. So we calculated corresponding tau. We uh, took into account that one of Fermi surfaces is not, uh, is a mm, uh, uh, hyper, hyperboloid, so banana. Uh, and we took corresponding, we do, did corresponding changes in relaxation time. In result, we have succeeded to get the general formula for um, Zeebe coefficient, which as you see, co consists of three pieces. Three pieces means that three candidates to topological transitions. And you see that we took into account all possible relaxations through this kappa parameter, which characterize the energy dependent part of relaxation time. And in the result, we uh, got, you can, here you can see, the contribution from each of uh, pieces of Fermi surface and totally uh, black. This is a sum of three contributions. And you can see how nice uh, our theoretical curve, analytically theoretical curve, describes the experimental situation. Uh, so thank you very much. Sorry for this technical um, uh, problem. And I would like to acknowledge that this work was supported by European Union Horizon Research and Innovation Program, COEXAN and Magenta. And I would like to thank the hospitality of Sierra Grenoble. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andre. Uh, probably one quick question uh, before we move to, we are a, a bit behind. So uh, if there is any, uh, one quick question we can take. Otherwise, let's move to Alexander, who is ready by now to get connected. Thank you very much, Andre. Yeah, thank you. Sorry.
for this uh, interruption. So, Alexander, we've made the introduction from Grenoble. I cannot share my screen for the moment. It's deactivated, so. No. No. Okay, I think it's okay. Is it okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. So thank you everyone. So uh, today I will talk about Fermi surface instabilities in the strongly correlated superconductor uranium tellure 2. So I work in the University Grenoble Alp in the Felix Laboratory in the CEA. So we had a nice introduction by, uh, by William this morning. So I will just remember some interesting points on this compound. So it was discovered in November 2018 by the group of uh, Niklas Butch. The superconducting state appears below 1.5 Kelvin in this compound. You have a nice diametrism here, and you have a large jump in the specific heat. And what is already very interesting, the fact that the gamma term doesn't go to zero at zero temperature. You have no nice shift anomaly when you pass TC. So it's the first indication that you have possibly point noise in the gap in this compound. And what is very interesting is a very anisotrope HE2 in this compound, as you can see here. This is HT2 for the different field orientation. So the polylimitation is represented here, it's three Tesla. So all the HT2 curves are above the polylimitation. And in fact, if you look when you apply magnetic field along the B axis, which is the magnetization axis in this compound, you see that you have almost a, a vertical HT2 in this compound. And so you have a, 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 a strong indication that we, we deal with a spin triplex superconductor. And the fact that the orbital limitation is represented here is 20 Tesla and the uh, HE2 is above this orbital limitation is that means that you have a, a, a mechanism which announces superconductivity under field in this system. So it's an orthorhombic crystal structure. The uranium uh, form a zigzag chain, which is common to other ferromagnetic superconductors. Uh, other. This, this one is a paramagnetic superconductor, but we have a ferromagnetic superconductor based on uranium, like uranium rhodium germanium and uranium cobalt germanium, who have the same crystal structure. The sample we measure has a RRR of 30, as you can see here, with a decrease of resistivity as a function of temperature. A nice uh, specific heat jump. And what is very interesting, in fact, is the magnetization in this compound. So it's paramagnet, but you have an easy magnetization axis, which is the A axis here, as you can see with the red curve. And when you put magnetic field along the B axis, you have, in fact, a maximum in the susceptibility, in the magnetic susceptibility, around 35 Kelvin. And we'll come back on this anomaly uh, later. In fact, uh, when you put a field on this compound, if you look at the magnetization, you have a strong increase a strong jump of the magnetization at 35 Tesla with a jump of 0.6 Bohr magneton. And this is due to a, med so it's a metamagnetic transition. And as you can see, you have hysteresis. So it's a first order metamagnetic transition. When you increase temperature, the first order collapse at a critical uh, endpoint around 7 Kelvin. And after the transition becomes a, a, a crossover. And you can follow this transition up to very high temperature. And in fact, there is a direct link, which is well summarized on this phase diagram, a direct link between the metamagnetic transition, which occurs at 35 uh, Tesla, and the uh, maximum in the sub magnetic susceptibility, which appears at 35 Kelvin. So you can really link the two. And uh, as I say, you have a first order transition, which occurs below around 7 to 10 Kelvin. What happens around this metamagnetic transition? If you measure the A coefficient of the resistivity, which is directly proportional to the effective mass, you see a large increase of the uh, A coefficient near HM, pretty symmetric and a, a decrease above. 
Similarly, in the thermodynamic coefficient, in the specific heat or in the magnetization, you have a large increase at HM and a decrease above HM. So you have strong magnetic fluctuation near the metamagnetic transition in this compound. Another interesting point is the fact that, in fact, HC2 coincides with the metamagnetic transition. As you can see here, uh, or on this curve here, you have a superconducting state, a little bit of reentrance here, but superconducting state, and at the metamagnetic transition, the uh, superconductivity is uh, destroyed and you enter in the normal state. So the nice phase diagram we can plot as a function of temperature field is a superconducting set with a, re a reinforcement of superconductivity which arrive near this metamagnetic transition, HM at 35 Tesla, the critical endpoint, which is around 7 to 10 Kelvin, and the link with the Tekimax, which appear uh, around 35 Kelvin. And the question we can ask is, is there a thermic surface reconstruction at the metamagnetic transition? Why we, uh, we can ask this question? In fact, if you look, the phase diagram of uranium tellure 2 is very similar to the phase diagram of uranium rhodium germanium and uranium cobalt germanium. These are two ferromagnetic superconductors, and they have the uh, similar phase diagram. The most spe spectacular one is in uranium rhodium germanium. When you apply magnetic field along the hard magnetization axis, this is a B axis similar to uranium tellure 2, you observe a reentrant superconductivity, uh, re superconductivity near uh, uh, HR, reorientation field. In fact, this field corresponds to the collapse of the Curie temperature. The Curie temperature at zero field in uranium rhodium germanium is 9 Kelvin. And when this Curie temperature collapses, when you apply magnetic field, you at very low temperature, at low temperature, you have uh, another superconducting state. And we have a strong indication in the thermoelectric power that there is a Fermi reconstruction at this peculiar magnetic field. And in uranium cobalt germanium, the same thing happens when the ferromagnetic uh, order collapses, you have an enhancement of the superconductivity. So, okay, these two are ferromagnetic, but we observe the same thing in the paramagnet uranium tellure 2. And the question is, uh, with the CB coefficient, can, uh, can we see some uh, Fermi surface instability at the metamagnetic transition? So, this is the thermoelectric power as a function of field for different temperature. So at very low temperature, 0.86 Kelvin, you can uh, see uh, the reentrant part. I mean, we are superconductor, normal, and again, superconductor. So, and the normal state in the CB coefficient is negative. Okay. And what is very interesting is the fact that you have a, a, a nice anomaly at the metamagnetic transition in the thermoelectric power. And when you increase temperature, this anomaly, which is uh, negative, become positive and very large, very, uh, uh, very big anomaly. And when you increase again the temperature, you have a crossover above the critical endpoint, above uh, 7 Kelvin. If we zoom now on the anomaly, you can see that as a function of temperature, the anomaly at the metamagnetic transition is uh, negative, up to 3.4 Kelvin. And above 3.4 Kelvin, the anomaly at the metamagnetic transition, change shine and become positive, and then finally you have a crossover. So we, we don't know exactly what happened, why we have this change of sign of the anomaly is uh, probably due to some ma magnetic scattering. If you look uh, in more detail the, the transition, you can see that you have a, a nice hysteresis even in the thermoelectric power, so at 3.5 Kelvin, 4.2, and around 7 Kelvin already the, the, the the hysteresis collapse, that means you, uh, the, the first order transition is uh, no crossover. So again, to, uh, to see uh, that the, the jump in the thermoelectric power uh, change shine, we can see it clearly on this graph, which represents the delta S as a function of temperature. At 3.4 Kelvin, we have a change of sign of the jump in the thermoelectric power at the metamagnetic transition. But more interestingly, if you extract the temperature dependence of the thermoelectric power with, the temp uh, with the magnetic, uh, magnetic uh, sweep of the thermoelectric power, we can uh, end with this kind of curve. And what is interesting is the fact that the, uh, the curve at 36 Tesla, the highest field we can have in a steady field, uh, shows that at very low temperature, the thermoelectric power, in fact, change shine. It passes from uh, negative below HM to positive above, above HM. So that means the dominant heat carrier in this system change at the metamagnetic transition. So it's the first indication 
of a Fermi surface reconstruction at HM in this system. To go in more detail about uh, the carrier density and uh, some change in the carrier density, we measure the Hall effect. Okay, this is rho xy as a function of, uh, of field. You can see that you have a large anomaly at the metamagnetic transition and similar to CB coefficient or resistivity, when you are above the critical endpoint, you end up with a crossover. And even in the Hall effect, you can see the reentrant part, you are superconductor, normal, negative Hall effect, and superconductor, and the big transition at the metamagnetic transition. If you, uh, in fact, look the temperature dependence of the Hall effect, which is represented here, extracted from the field sweep, you can see that there is a maximum as a function of temperature. In fact, this maximum at low field coincides with the techie max, so we have a maximum in the Hall effect around 35 Kelvin. And if you increase magnetic field, you see that the position of the maximum uh, in temperature decrease. Decrease up to HM. If you go above HM, the position of the maximum increase again up to high temperature. This will be summarized on the phase diagram later. So to analyze the Hall effect, to extract the density of carrier, we should, uh, in fact, have uh, an idea of the magnitude of the anomalous Hall effect. So the main assumption to analyze the Hall effect is there is two contributions, ordinary part, which is linked to the density of carrier, and an anomalous uh, Hall effect, which is linked to magnetic scattering. And the, the anomalous Hall effect is dominated by skew scattering. This is uh, uh, generally the case in, uh, in a strongly collected system. So in this picture, in fact, the maximum of the Hall effect is a border between incoherent skew scattering at high temperature and coherent skew scattering at low temperature. And so there is a prediction of the anomalous Hall effect, which uh, uh, is given by this expression for coherent skew scattering for T uh, above Tm, we have uh, this expression proportional to resistivity. And for T below Tm, for coherent skew scattering, we have a rho square. Okay, so we will evaluate the anomalous Hall effect using uh, anomalous Hall effect as a function of field using magnetization data. So the magnetization data uh, are, are the data uh, uh, from um, our colleague Miyake. So this is the magnetization as a the, the function of magnetic field. You can see very nicely the metamagnetic transition. We use this data and we plot uh, uh, the Hall effect as a function of rho square times the uh, magnetization divided by the field or rho multiplied by the magnetization divided by field. And what you can see is that high temperature, in fact, it's uh, all the curve of, all, of the whole effect are on, uh, I mean, all the data of the whole effect are on only one curve, meaning that we are really doing with incoherent skew scattering. All the signal is anomalous, incoherent skew scattering. When we decrease temperature, in fact, the data are well fitted by this expression. I mean, we deal with coherent skew scattering this time. And what is interesting is the fact that uh, you have a change of the magnitude of the anomalous Hall effect when we pass HM. At low field, we have this slope. At high field, we have this slope, for example. Similarly here, two slope. So that means the magnitude of the Hall effect, of the anomalous Hall effect, change as uh, when we pass the metamagnetic transition. All these observations are summarized in this table, where we have two coefficients below and above HN for the coherent skew scattering at low temperature, and uh, an unique coefficient for the incoherent skew scattering at high temperature. So uh, once we uh, know the magnitude of the anomalous Hall effect, in fact, we take the raw data and we remove the anomalous part from the raw data. And what we obtain, so this is the raw data and the anomalous part, which is represented with a, a line here, scatter line. And if we remove the anomalous part, we see that this is the ordinary Hall effect, which is linked to the density of carrier. The ordinary Hall effect is almost zero for high temperature. And what we observe for low temperature, there is a strong, in fact, uh, change of the uh, ordinary Hall effect at the metamagnetic transition. The number of carriers, in fact, decreased by a factor of nine. So it's a second and strong indication that something drastic happened on the Fermi surface at HM. 
Is it the transition between itinerant, itinerant to localized F electron for the non -tweedent? And is there a link to the uh, any Lifshitz transition? For the moment, we don't know too because we don't have access to quantum oscillation and to see if there is uh, some change in the Fermi uh, surface topology. But as, at least we have a, 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 an instability of the Fermi surface at the metamagnetic transition. This is, uh, uh, in fact, all the observations are summarized on this phase diagram. So you see the HE2, which is very big, eh, 35 uh, Tesla, almost vertical HE2, uh, an increase and in reinforcement of, of the superconductivity just close to, to HM. Uh, HM is represented here. We have the maximum of the Hall effect, which coincide with the maximum uh, in the susceptibility. This maximum go to, in fact, the critical endpoint doesn't go to zero because you, the transition become first order and after increase again to high temperature here. So we believe that at high temperature, we have incoherent scuscattering regime, paramagnetic state. The coherent scuscattering regime below uh, at low temperature, below the maximum of the, the susceptibility of the, or, of the whole effect. So it's a correlated paramagnetic state. And above the metamagnetic transition, we have a polarized paramagnetic state. Uh, in fact, after measure, I mean, we measure that before, but we measure the another direction. We apply this time the magnetic field along the easy magnetic ejection axis, the A axis in this system. Why we were interested in measuring the, uh, the CB coefficient for H parallel to A? Because if you look the magnetization in uranium tellure 2 for H parallel to A, it increases a lot. It's really like what we observe in uranium cobalt germanium. And if you take the derivative of the magnetization, you see a kink, a kink around five to six Tesla. And this kink, in fact, appears at the same critical polarization where the metamagnetic transition occurs for H parallel to B. So something happened in this compound for H parallel to A, easy magnetization axis around six, uh, around six uh, Tesla. And in fact, it's really like what we observe in uranium cobalt germanium. In uranium cobalt germanium, the magnetization increases a lot. If you take the derivative of the magnetization as a function of magnetic field, you see some anomaly too. And in fact, this anomaly in transport are very, uh, very big, become very big. In the whole effect or in the CB coefficient, you have nice anomaly in transport. And this anomaly in uranium cobalt germanium are linked to successive Lichis transition which occur in this system. And really, we have a Uh, a strong indication of that because we have access to quantum oscillation in the case of uranium cobalt germanium. So the question is, this little kink in uranium tellure 2 is similar, is there an initial transition associated to this anomaly at 5 or 6 Tesla? So we measure the CB coefficient. The CB coefficient is here, is negative, as you have the HE2, and you have indeed a nice small anomaly around 5.6 Tesla. We have other anomaly more broad around 10 and 20 uh, Tesla. Similarly, in the uh, thermal conductivity, we observe the same uh, kink at 5.6, uh, sorry, here, at 5.6 uh, uh, Tesla, and even the HE2 the here. In uh, the resistivity, similarly, we have a, a, little a little kink in the resistivity and the maximum in the whole effect. So if we zoom now on the CB coefficient data, the function of field, you can see easily HE2, this is a black arrow, and the anomaly at 5.6 Tesla, which is almost uh, independent of temperature. When you increase temperature, the anomaly moves, but just a little bit. And uh, similarly, we have a, a a large anomaly around 10 Tesla, and another one around 20 Tesla. This anomaly, uh, the question we can ask, are these anomalies this is transition, similarly to what we observe in uranium cobalt germanium. So we had a nice introduction by, uh, by André about this is transition. In fact, uh, this is transition and topological change of the Fermi surface. Historically, Lipschitz thought about two kinds of uh, Lipschitz of uh, of uh, topological transition, a void formation. So that means you have a, a new pocket which appear in, inside your, your Brisbane zone, or a neck breaking, you have a, a, a transition between a, a cylinder to an ellipsoid. So you change the topology 
of your Fermi surface. And this kind of transition are expected to give a strong anomaly, particularly in the thermoelectric power. You have a, 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 a large anomaly expected for uh, electron or all pocket. And this is very different to what is observed in electrical conductivity, where you expect only a, a kink in the electrical conductivity. You expect to have a large anomaly in the thermoelectric power. So it's why it's very interesting to measure thermoelectric power to track any, any uh, Fermi surface anomaly. Uh, using, in fact, the, the formula by, uh, in the paper of Varlamov, we can, in fact, uh, extract some parameter. But this formula, so this Z is a tuning parameter. In our case, this is the magnetic field. This formula is difficult to use because we have always uh, uh, magnetic field dependence of the ordinary Hall effect. So ordinary, sorry, uh, thermoelectric power as a function of field. So uh, it's difficult to use this formula. What we use instead is the temperature dependent. So this is a thermoelectric power divided by T as a function of temperature. And we measure specially around the anomaly at 5.6 Tesla. And we see we have a beginning of a, of a divergence of the thermoelectric power. And in fact, we can fit this, uh, this divergence using this formula, which is given for, uh, for a neck breaking. And for, from this formula, we can extract T star which correspond, in fact, to the energy of the Fermi pocket, which is involved, and Z, which is, in fact, the, ener the energy distance with respect to the critical field, HE, where the Lipschitz transition occurs. So, really, we, uh, we are really sure that the anomaly we observe at uh, 5.6 Tesla is really a Lipschitz transition. For the other anomaly, they change too much in temperature, and it's difficult, in fact, to analyze them. It's, it's, they are broader. So it's difficult to, to claim they are linked to a Lipschitz transition. But H1, the one at uh, 5.6 Tesla, is uh, really a Lipschitz transition. Let's say a little word about the, the Fermi surface. In fact, there is some uh, calculation, DFT plus U or, uh, or JJA plus U. All, in fact, uh, all converge on a quasi-two-dimensional surface. And it's why the, the formula we use from uh, neck breaking, maybe we pass from a cylinder pocket to, to, um, to an ellipsoid when we put magnetic field. But for the moment, we have no experimental uh, uh, proof of uh, this is a, the real uh, Fermi surface because we don't have quantum oscillation and there is uh, uh, no hard test measurement. So in conclusion, for H parallel to B, we have a Fermi surface reconstruction at, uh, at HM. We have uh, incoherence with scattering at high temperature, coherence with scattering at low temperature. When we put magnetic field along the A axis, along the easy magnetization axis, we really have a Lipschitz transition which occurs at 5.6 Tesla. And we have to note that this uh, anomaly which occurs at 5.6 Tesla is the same critical, uh, appears, sorry, as the same critical polarization that the uh, uh, metamagnetic transition which occur for H parallel to B. So I would like to thank all my collaborators. So especially Kunyu, who has postdoc with us during two years, the CEO of Noble, all the collaborators, Jacques Nebel, Daniel Bresswell, Jean-Pascal Brisant, Jacques Fouquet, Gérard Laperto for the crystal growth, and uh, uh, postdoc, Michael Valiscas. And we have a strong collaboration with LNCMI Grenoble, with Ilya Shekin and Gabriel Sefar. So we have the possibility to measure to steady field no up to 36 Tesla. So it's very important for uh, thermal conductivity or thermoelectric power to have access to steady field uh, so high. And we have, a, a, of course, a strong collaboration with William Nafo in Spellfield in Toulouse. And we have a, a, no, a, a new collaboration with Tony N in Dresden. And we have to thank, of course, Daya Oki, which uh, is a strong uh, uh, it gives us uh, the first impulse for, to, to study this material and our collaborator in, in Japan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. Uh, we have uh, probably time for a question. Uh, if there is uh, any question, that there are many actually on uh, Alexander. I've got many, but I can do it privately later, uh, but if there is any, uh, any uh, question right now.
Okay, so uh, I, I mean, uh, probably it is better now to move to, uh, uh, otherwise we, have, we will have a long discussion, to move to the uh, next uh, uh, speaker, to the final uh, talk uh, from uh, Aniru, uh, Aniru uh, Chandra Sekaran from Boston University who is going to uh, discuss the, the uh, classification of all these Fermi surface topological transitions in 2D. Anirudh? Uh, hi, Joseph. Uh, let me turn on my video. Although I'm a bit worried that uh, my internet bandwidth is a little low. Let's see, let's hope uh, nothing bad happens. Uh, let me try and share my screen. Oh. Uh, okay, I think uh, uh, just a second. Um, From uh, Can everyone can can you see my uh, slide? Yes. Yes, that's clear. Uh, Okay, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, thanks for being patient. We have, uh, we, have, we have come to the end of the session pretty much. And uh, uh, today I'll be talking about uh, a classification scheme for Fermi surface topological transitions. In particular, those Fermi surface topological transitions which uh, are referred to as multi critical Lipschitz transitions. And uh, this work was done in collaboration with Alex Steik, Joseph Petoris, who's with us today. Uh, moderating the session, and Claudio Shamon, who's uh, my advisor. Uh, let's begin at the beginning. Uh, so uh, a Fermi surface topological transition is a situation in which the Fermi surface changes drastically uh, when some parameters in the system are tuned. Uh, Lifshitz identified one of the earliest Fermi surface topological transitions where uh, the th this is known as the neck narrowing type of Fermi surface topological transition. As you can see, the, uh, the neck of the Fermi surface narrows and it becomes a singular uh, Fermi surface and then it splits into two disconnected pieces. Uh, so this, uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, and why do we study Fermi surface topological transitions? We got a lot of motivation over the last two days. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, the two examples that I would be giving have uh, already been talked about uh, in the previous talks. And, but the important point is that uh, Fermi surface topological transitions, especially multi-critical Lipschitz transitions, have non-trivial consequences for transport, magnetism, and uh, other phenomena and materials. And uh, something very interesting happens in these multi-critical Fermi surface uh, topological transitions. Uh, the density of states diverges and susceptibilities, various susceptibilities diverge. As a result, on one hand, you would have enhanced electron electron correlation. And on the other hand, because of the divergence of susceptibilities, you have very strong screening. And the competition between these two effects is a very interesting phenomena to study. And uh, nested singularities have been associated with various uh, instabilities, even at the level of a Van Hoff singularities, but even more so uh, for higher order singularities. I, I will uh, explain some of these ideas more carefully, including density of states and divergence as we go on. Uh, but for now, I'll motivate the talk. And uh, 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 here, for example, uh, we have the divergence of heat capacity in strontium ruthenate 327, about which uh, Andreas gave a very intriguing talk earlier today. And uh, this was this can be accounted for by this unusual type of divergence can be accounted by uh, treating the system in the context of a higher order singularity. Uh, and likewise, uh, the correl various correlated electron phenomena and twisted bilayer graphene, uh, which was mentioned by Hiroki Sobe yesterday in his talk, and uh, most notably the uh, optic, the channeling conduct conductance can be uh, uh, fit by assuming uh, higher order singularities in that context. And uh, more on this a little later. Uh, and likewise, there are some instabilities which can, uh, for example, here is a density wave instability which can be accounted by the fact that there are nested uh, singularities in the Fermi surface. And uh, let's uh, therefore like look at the simplest singularity in two dimensions because I, my talk will be focused on two dimensions. Uh, the simplest one is the Van Hoff singularity, which corresponds, which arises from the saddle point, the regular saddle point. And uh, as we tune the chemical potential, the Fermi surface goes from electron-like to whole-like. And uh, at the transition, the Fermi surface develops a singularity. 
so the, at the origin, the Fermi surface is singular in the differential geometric sense. It's not smooth at the origin, the Fermi surface. And uh, this is not the only singular behavior associated with the Van Hoff singularity. The density of states also diverges uh, logarithmically uh, across the Fermi energy. And uh, the uh, reason for this is uh, very easy to understand. Uh, the, de the density of states is defined as follows. We just visit each point in the Boulouin zone, integrate, integrate over the entire Boulouin zone with a delta function that simply fires at, fires if your dispersion happens to equal the specified energy. And this integral can be converted into a surface integral with uh, the gradient sitting in a denominator. The surface is a constant energy surface corresponding to the energy epsilon. And whenever we have uh, a point uh, in, the, in the constant energy surface or curve uh, on which the a gradient vanishes, then there's a possibility for divergence of density of states. And this is precisely what happens in the Van Hoff singularity. At, in the zero energy contour, there's the critical point at the origin, and this is responsible for the divergence of density of states. Therefore, just to uh, uh, sort of motivate the content ahead, we are interested in cases where the gradient vanishes on uh, certain energy contours and, and uh, some non-trivial ways in which the gradient vanishes uh, so as to lead to interesting uh, divergent behavior for density of states. And for that, we need to understand the notion of a higher order critical point. Uh, an ordinary critical point is a point where the gradient vanishes. It could be a maxima, minima, or, or different types of saddle points. Uh, in addition, if the Hessian determinant also vanishes, if you recall from calculus, Hessian determinant sort of tells us uh, whether a point is a maximum or minimum. But if the Hessian vanishes, then we have a so-called higher order critical point. And uh, uh, let me give some examples. Uh, with their contours. Uh, so, for example, in this higher, in both higher order critical points, we can see that this, the zero energy contour is singular. Uh, it passes through this critical point, and it also has singularity in the in differential geometry sense. It's not smooth. And uh, 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 as we tune the chemical potential across this zero energy, the Fermi surface undergoes a transition, and the, there is a singularity. Uh, there's a singular behavior of the Fermi surface at precisely the zero energy, and uh, this is not the only way we can uh, attain a Fermi surface topological transition, uh, that is simply by tuning chemical potential. We could imagine tuning some parameters in the system. Uh, for example, the, these parameters could manifest in the dispersion. Let's consider this higher order singularity kx cubed minus ky squared, uh, and let us add a perturbation tkx to it. Uh, if t is negative, what happens is that the Fermi C is not simply connected anymore. Uh, and the Fermi surface, the zero energy Fermi con uh, zero energy contour, is disconnected. There is a maxima, and there is a saddle point in the occupied region. I'm, I'm referring to the Fermi C in blue. Uh, you know, they're they, they occupied uh, uh, energies, the negative energies. And if we tune T to zero, what happens is that these critical points start moving towards the origin, and at T equals zero, these critical points merge. So basically, there are two critical points which are sitting on top of each other, giving rise to the name multi-critical point. Or, and the transition is a multi-critical transition uh, uh, because we see that two disconnected uh, pieces of the uh, whole uh, part of the whole C, um, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, two disconnected part of the whole C uh, merge. And, uh, and across this transition, the Fermi surface becomes singular at the origin, uh, exactly at the singularity. And let's assume that we've tuned uh, the singularity to uh, the, this dispersion to the singularity. We can look at how density of states behaves, and it does diverge in a power law fashion. At the, uh, across this across the zero energy, the the power law divergence is given by epsilon to the negative one sixth rather than logarithmic. And more interestingly, uh, there is a asymmetry between the uh, two regions, the negative and positive energies for the singularity. And this kind of asymmetry. Uh, this kind of behavior is not peculiar to this singularity. In fact, uh, higher order singularities in general cause power law divergence, and they have asymmetric, uh, often is, have asymmetric coefficients for divergence. And as we saw, we had to tune the parameter t to zero. The, these singularities often require tuning of parameters to obtain, and they are somewhat atypical at generic points in the Boulouin zone. Uh, it is rather hard to obtain these higher order singularities at some random points in the Boulouin zone. Some points are more suitable towards uh, uh, these higher order singularities. So all these things pose a few questions. How many higher order singularities are there? Uh, and it's clear that there would be infinitely many of them, but are some more important than the others? And if so, how do we index them? We do love to have integer indices in physics. 
and how difficult is a given higher order singularity to obtain? Is there some quantitative parameter that characterizes the difficulty? And as I mentioned uh, before, like in experience, one can see that uh, these singularities are not easy to obtain at, at different points on Bellumas zone. Are there any points in the Bellumas zone where they're likely to more likely to occur? And these are precisely the questions answered in our paper, uh, in our work. And I would be talking about uh, these aspects. And these are addressed partially through the mathematical framework of catastrophe theory. Uh, although catastrophe theory is designed for generic dimensions, uh, in two dimensions, uh, catastrophe theory is really applicable if you have seven or less tuning parameters in your system. And the important point is that the tuning parameters, it need not be, it's, it need, you need not specify the precise way these tuning parameters figure into the system, but it's a very general probabilistic statement in space of functions. And catastrophe theory guarantees that if you have seven or less tuning parameters, uh, you have only 17 singularities which are like typically likely to occur. It's a very precise mathematical notion of typicality. I can talk about it if someone is interested uh, after the end of the talk. And if uh, and these 17 singularities are indexed by three numbers, uh, core rank, core dimension, and determinacy. And so, and uh, sometimes there are degeneracies. There are two. There there are often pairs of singularities which have the same set of these three numbers. And those can be resolved by, those degeneracies can be resolved by introducing a winding number. And at the heart of catastrophe theory is smooth equivalence between functions. Uh, what it means is that uh, we say that two functions are equivalent, smoothly equivalent. If there is some coordinate transformation phi, such that the f, f and g, f can be uh, put in the form of g under phi. And this function phi has to be smooth and its inverse also has to be smooth. Basically such coordinate transformations smooth maps with the smooth inverse or diffeomorphisms as they are called, uh, simply smoothly distort the energy contours without doing anything drastic. Uh, for example, this is what a smooth map would do to a saddle point, for example, a regular saddle point. And uh, the, the smooth maps are very important because catastrophe theory is framed in terms of smooth map. And uh, to, the topology of Fermi surface in, is indeed preserved only under smooth, uh, uh, smooth maps. And the most important aspect, which I think is like one of the important uh, messages of our paper, is that the power law divergence and also the ratio of free factors uh, of, the, uh, of the density of states divergence is preserved only under smooth coordinate transformation. So if you have a coordinate map which is not smooth, uh, then the power law divergence is not preserved. This can be mathematically shown. And uh, having said all of this, let's motivate the very first index of catastrophe theory, co rank. For that, let's look at these two singularities. So we see that one common feature of these singularities is that they are somewhat insufficient as far as the quadratic part is concerned. For example, both miss kx squared, and it's like they miss one quadratic direction in, or quadratic t's. So this number of core rank formalizes this notion. And before that, let's recall that for a higher order critical point, in addition to gradient vanishing, the first derivative, we need the second derivative, uh, that is the determinant of the Hessian, to also vanish. And if the determinant vanishes, we know that uh, at least one of the eigenvalues of the Hessian has to vanish because the determinant is just a product of eigenvalues. And the core rank is simply defined as the number of eigenvalues of the Hessian which vanish. For example, and this precisely gives you how many quadratic uh, parts or directions are missing from your dispersion. For example, this kx to the 4 minus k by square dispersion has core rank 1, and we have the kx by part missing. So uh, one of the one out of the two directions is missing, although the other direction is present. On the contrary, the dispersion kx cubed minus ky cubed has core rank two. It has both quadratic directions missing, as reflected by the fact that there is no quadratic piece in the dispersion. So that's core rank for us. And the next number is determinacy. Uh, to motivate determinacy, let's recall that oftentimes when we engage with functions, complicated functions, we'd like to Taylor expand the function to some order and truncate the Taylor polynomial, think Taylor expansion, and you work with the Taylor polynomial ra rather than the full function. And and we don't we are often cavalier about what order we can truncate the uh, function at, but uh, it's a little subtle of a concept. Uh, and this determinacy uh, uh, is a number, the minimum order at which the nth degree Taylor polynomial of the function is smoothly equivalent to the function itself. For example, if we take this function f of x comma y, let's say it's Taylor expansion is just quartic piece within parenthesis x to the four minus y square, plus there are fifth order, sixth order, and correction so on. You can show that this function has determinacy four, which means that in some neighborhood of origin, about which we've Taylor expanded the function, 
the function is smoothly equivalent to this Taylor polynomial, this quartic Taylor polynomial x to the power minus y square. And in fact, to uh, uh, look at uh, closer to home examples, if we have this function f, we would often truncate the function to linear order. And uh, the fact that we can do it is legitimized by the fact uh, the property of this function that the determinacy is one, so that this function is smoothly equivalent to this linear part. Likewise, uh, g of x is smoothly equivalent to x, the quadratic part, the saddle part of the function. The higher order terms are not uh, important in some neighborhood of the origin. And uh, so to summarize, for determinacy, we need some point about which we want to tailor expand the function. And we need some order up to which we tailor expand. And the Taylor polynomial, uh, often denoted as jn of f, uh, is smoothly equivalent to f. That is, there is a smooth coordinate transformation with a smooth inverse which puts f and jn in the same form in some neighborhood around the point x0. So that if you recall, uh, uh, density of states and other quantities can rely very strongly on uh, being smoothly equivalent. And uh, in, in some neighborhood of the origin, uh, uh, we can work with the pol Taylor polynomial rather than the full function and rest assured that uh, the computations are correct. And uh, the last index is co-dimension, it's somewhat uh, subtle and more difficult to motivate. For that, let's point out that these higher order singularities are unstable to certain types of perturbations. For example, this cubic uh, higher order singularity, kx cubed minus ky squared, if we add a linear uh, term pkx, however small a negative t is, it will always split the multi-critical point into two ordinary critical points, basically a maxima and minima. And t could be as small as you choose, but it will still break the singularity. Uh, and in, this is uh, this is referred to as instability of these higher order singularities. On the contrary, there are certainly smooth coordinate transformations and perturbations in which uh, uh, the contours are just simply distorted smoothly. That is, you know, under the, the perturb function is smoothly equivalent to the original higher order singularity. So there seem to be these two types of uh, perturbations, uh, classes of perturbations, uh, the good class of perturbations which preserve your singularity up to a smooth, uh, up to smooth equivalence, and the bad types of perturbations which break your singularity or split them into ordinary critical points. So how do we methodically treat these perturbations, and which perturbations give, uh, again, smoothly equivalent uh, higher order singularities, and which ones do not? So let's turn on this question a little. This section would be a little mathematically involved. I will do my best to. Uh, uh, be geometric about uh, uh, and and uh, like you know less uh, technical about this. Uh, let's see what happens to the higher order singularity if you subject it to some smooth coordinate transformation. We know that it will still give a higher order singularity smoothly equivalent to it, uh, but if we instead use a one parameter family, that is, this, there's a family of smooth coordinate transformations uh, uh, which are parameterized by real number t. Let's see what happens. For example, we could choose this coordinate transformation gamma t, such that like gamma of x comma y is x minus comma y minus t x. And let's further uh, assume that at t equals zero we get the identity. So uh, the gamma z gamma t equals zero is just the identity identity transformation. And we can see what happens to the singularity under the smooth coordinate transformation. So basically, it it morphs into morphs into a different uh, function. But we do know that this new function is also smoothly equivalent to the higher order singularity because basically we just started with a smooth coordinate transformation, right? And why do we do this? And let's uh, think of it in, in geometric terms. This function f of x, this higher order singularity, is a point in a vector space of polynomials. And under this one parameter family, this uh, uh, point moves in. Uh, that this is really this gamma t under gamma t f t of x is really a curve in the polynomial space that just happens to pass through our given singularity at t equals zero. So uh, all these such gamma t really define curves that pass through your uh, higher order singularity, and we can uh, imagine defining the derivative, uh, the tangent vector to this uh, uh, curve at to each such curve at a at the point f of x, and Further, one can think of the space of all these tangents, and it can be shown that that space is actually a polynomial space. It's a hyperspace, or it's a hyperplane, basically. It's a subspace of the polynomial space that contains all these tangent vectors. And remember that these are tangent vectors under smooth coordinate transformations. And why is this tangent space important? The number co-dimension is defined in terms of this tan tangent space. 
So it's basically the co-dimension of the tangent space. It's the dimension of the polynomial space, full polynomial space minus the dimension of the tangent space. So it gives those directions in which the uh, the co-dimension gives the number of directions in which the, the singularity will not move. So if you recall, uh, under smooth coordinate transformations, the singularity moves in these tangent directions infinitesimally, and it doesn't move in certain directions. Basically, those are the, irre the, re the relevant perturbations to borrow an expression of a, uh, another paper. Uh, so uh, yeah, so the co-dimension is gives you the co-dimension of the tangent space. That is the number of missing directions in the tangent space. And, uh, and one can take a basis for the tangent space and complete it into a basis for the full uh, polynomial space uh, by adding some missing directions P1 through PR. And, it, and then we come to this uh, extremely powerful concept of a universal unfolding, which says that any small perturbation of F can be smoothly transformed into something like this. It's just F to which some relevant perturbations are added. So basically the missing directions. So there are, are such possible directions in which you can move. And the co-dimension, it literally gives you the number of such directions. And uh, such an expression like this uh, called the universal unfolding captures the, pos uh, the effect of all possible small perturbations on F. And uh, yeah, so with this, we can list all, all the catastrophes. Uh, here are some of the catastrophes with uh, some of the information removed and you can uh, find the more uh, uh, informative tables in the paper. And uh, uh, yeah, we can look at some of these catastrophes in closer details. Let's take one, one example. And this example has four rank one, which captures the fact that there's one quadratic direction missing. And it has four dimension two, which means that there are two relevant perturbation directions, which uh, can take you out of the singularity. And it has determinacy four, which means that any function for which this singularity is the fourth degree Taylor polynomial can be truncated to fourth degree. And finally, as I said, uh, sometimes we have uh, degeneracy in spite of these three indices. So we introduce another index fine thing, which counts the number of times the dispersion changes sign around the critical point. So here it changes sign four times. So the winding is four. And finally, I want to mention that this dispersion has KY reflection and it also has a pi rotation about the origin. These are the symmetries that the singularity is cons uh, consistent with. We can show that the singularity cannot be made consistent with any other non-trivial rotation by smooth coordinate transformation. So uh, finally, we get to the importance of high symmetry points. Uh, as I mentioned, some points are more likely to uh, host uh, uh, critical points in the Bruno zone, and these are precisely the high symmetry points. This is because, recall that to get a higher order singularity, we need to tune gradient and Hessian determinant to zero. Uh, and in higher order singular, sing, sing, higher order, uh, sorry, in high symmetry points, the gradient is already constrained to be zero. And as a result, these points and lines of high symmetry are very convenient to obtain a higher order singular point because we just need to tune one less function to zero, the Hessian determinant, basically. And also, particular symmetry, singularity can be made consistent only with a limited set of symmetries. As I mentioned before, the earth singularity we saw earlier is consistent only with pi rotation symmetry. You cannot make it consistent with pi by four rotation. So we can look at different possible wallpaper groups in two dimension and look at the uh, Bruno zones for these wallpaper groups and we can precisely find the high symmetry points. And at each high symmetry points, we can list those singularities which are likely to occur. For example, if we look at this wallpaper group uh, uh, for which the point uh, group is P4, it's generated by pi by two rotation. That is, it has C4, uh, as a uh, point group. And at the gamma point and M point, you have four fold rotation symmetry. So the uh, so only one type of singularity really is likely to occur, the X9 singularity. Likewise, in the X point, uh, it has the phi rotation symmetry and these singularities are likely to occur, which, which take this form Kx to the 2n minus Ky squared. Uh, and so we can do this for all the different 17 wallpaper groups. And it really uh, makes it easy for us to to diagnose what kind of higher order singularities can occur at different points in your uh, uh, Renoir zone. To summarize, a higher order singularity can be classified by these numbers, the core rank, which gives you the number of missing quadratic pieces or directions, the determinacy, the order at which you can safely tailor expand and truncate the Taylor series, and the core dimension, which is the number of parameters or relevant perturbations you have to tune uh, to zero to obtain the singularity. So this code number core dimension clearly gives a measure for how easy it is to obtain a singularity. A higher co-dimension singularity would typically require tuning of more parameters. And uh, so 
you would typically expect a lower four dimension singularity to occur earlier, which is also the basis for the 17 fold classification. And finally, the lattice symmetries that are higher order singularity can be made consistent with are very restricted. Uh, having said these, uh, let me just point out that this classification is not cosmetic. The, I'll illustrate that with uh, a, an example. Before that, I had pointed out that uh, di the di density of states divergence and the ratio of three factors is only preserved in the smooth coordinate transformation. Then this classification is, is equivalent equivalence based on equivalence up to smooth coordinate transformations. So let's consider these three functions. Uh, they all have the same cubic part and uh, f and g uh, have vary at the quartic part for f has 8kx to the 4 while g has 9kx to the 4 and h has no quartic part. In fact, if we look at the contours of f, f and g plotted in the same range and same x and y range, we see that they look rather very similar. And in fact, one may even want to truncate this uh, polynomial at cubic degree because it gives a function with very similar looking topology, right? Like two curves touching tangentially at the origin. And in fact, uh, if we compute the determinacy for these functions, we see that they are very different. So F and H have determinacy four, which means that it's safe to truncate uh, Taylor polynomials at fourth degree, while G has determinacy six. So you cannot truncate G, a function having G as a six degree Taylor polynomial at degree four. You will invariably get incorrect results four or even less for, for that matter. This is, this, is, this is clearly shown by computing the density of states divergence for these functions. So F has a density of states that diverges as e to the negative one quarter and the ratio of three factors one over root two, while G has a density of states divergence negative one third and a ratio of three factors one half, while H has the same as F, which is negative one quarter and ratio uh, of three factors one over root two. So if we had G as the dispersion to start with, and if we had truncated to cubic order, we would have got a legitimate looking function, which had a power law divergence. It's a single isolated critical point. It has power law divergence and it would look like we've done the right thing, but it is not the correct thing because the density of states for these two functions are completely different. And by computing these indices that I mentioned earlier, uh, the catastrophe theory indices, we can unambiguously pinpoint which singularity we have and therefore we are assured that we are computing the correct density of states divergence and uh, I, I would like to mention that a, a very similar classification scheme was uh, obtained by uh, a different group uh, at MIT uh, uh, led by Noah Luan uh, and Liang Fu and uh, their scheme is not based on catastrophe theory but by scaling and some other ideas and in fact they were the ones who gave uh, this term uh, relevant perturbation uh, and having said that, I would like to thank you for your patience. And uh, uh, I would uh, I'd like to acknowledge our funding agencies, uh, the DOE, US DOE, uh, at UK RI and Royal Society. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, are there any questions? Thank you very much, Anir. Any Any questions from the audience? So it takes some time to digest all this information, but the whole point is that this was the continuation of uh, the expansion of the work that uh, Andreas Rost earlier uh, presented, who presented uh, a, uh, a kind of higher order singularity relevant to three to seven. And uh, then uh, uh, the aim of uh, the work with Anirod was basically to expand and classify and make classification of all possibilities in 2D in all all um, uh, possible groups. So, if there are no other uh, questions, so let's thank everyone of the speakers. It was a really, I mean. We were a little bit, unfortunately, in the middle, but uh, we managed to, to repair it, uh, uh, the technological uh, difficulties. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your uh, talks and for a great session. And all the best. Now that's the, ah, we need to take a picture screenshot. Okay, this is what uh, Edwin is, is, uh, is uh,
telling us. So basically, uh, please, uh, we, we need to, everybody to, yeah, good. Edwin, are you going to do it? As you want, I can't, but it will be good if you have one also. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes, you can. You, yes, if you want, I can take one and you also. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, let's see. One. Okay. Perfect. Nice. Very good. One. Yeah, okay. So, you do it. Uh, let me see. Gallery view. Okay. So, uh, I see the gallery, gallery view, but then where, which one is the, the one? Just with your button in your <laughs> keyboard. Okay. Seems to be quite sunny in some places. Uh -huh. Amalia seems to have a, a glow around her. <laughs> Always there is a glow. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Well, Scotland, you can guess, is well, more than very variable. Pablo, would you like to do it? Uh, I, uh, Pablo, you need to mute. Oh, everybody, look at the camera. That's fine. Marta Lomana and what? Okay, let's try. Perfect. Yeah, here it is. Okay, nice. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. So let's see. Uh, can you send us the picture? Yes, of course. We are going to oh, do that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Bye bye, Professor Gertrude. Yeah. Thank bye you. Bye. Everybody. Okay. So, oh, Edwin. Yeah, see. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording. Okay. I can do it. I will.